So here's the reality. An algorithm can exalt you. That made you popular, but it did not increase your authority. Mm. An algorithm and content can make you known. But see, there's things in the kingdom that are measured and there's things that are weighed. There's 2,000 person churches that don't weigh a lot in the kingdom. And then there's 200 person churches that carry a lot of weight. There's people with a million followers that carry very little gravity and weight in the kingdom. And there's people with 80,000 followers that carry significant weight. And so I think what we're here to do as we have these conversations, which we've been doing on a monthly basis, is to say in all humility, let's rightly divide the scriptures and let's make sure that as we're increasing, we're also increasing in weight, not just popularity. So good. I wanted to add a couple things as well, just some verses. We're gonna all be overlapping, giving lots of verses. So guys, have your notepad out. Um, one thing that I'm very heartbroken about is when the people of God are coming to our services, they're hurting, they're broken. Many of them are at the end of the rope. Many of them financially are devastated. And then we go and abuse them. I'm thinking like, these are people God has trusted us with. These are people we're supposed to be tender with, compassionate and loving towards. So for me guys, and I'll just, again, we all could speak for ourselves tonight. I have a zero tolerance policy when it comes to abusing the people of God. I have a yeah. zero, no games, no fooling around when it comes to seeing the people of God being abused, seeing witchcraft performed on them, especially when this is happening in the church. If you look at Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 30, it says, keep watch over yourselves and the flock, which the Holy Spirit has made you an overseer. Be shepherds yeah. of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. So Luke is saying, listen, Keep watch over yourselves and keep watch over the flock. And look at verse 29. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come among you and not spare the flock, even from whom your own number of men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw disciples after them. So the Bible's saying, listen, there's gonna be wolves coming in. They're not gonna spare the flock. They're gonna look for leaders that, or people that follow them, that worship them, that follow after their entourage and not follow out the true way. And if you look at just one more, 1 John chapter 4, verses one, uh, verse 1 says, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone to the world. So we are doing something biblical, and there's 7,000 of you, praise the Lord. Let's try to hit 10,000 tonight. That would be amazing. But there are people that are going out, and they are distorting the truth, and we are called, according to John, to test the spirits. So that's, all, that's what we're doing tonight. We are testing the spirits. And I wanted to touch on what you said, Pagani, about witchcraft not being a secondary issue. Witchcraft is something, I just want to reiterate, that we should divide over. There's primary issues in theology like the virgin birth, the sinlessness of Christ, the death, burial, and resurrection, salvation by faith alone. These are primary issues. And then there's secondary things like we talk about the timing of the rapture. What day should we worship, Saturday or Sunday? Are the right. gifts for today or not? Those are secondary issues. This is not a secondary issue. Teaching on the third eye is demonic and witchcraft. Controlling people with the Holy Spirit and saying you're gonna control their body is demonic and witchcraft. Teaching Lord. new age doctrine, which we're gonna go into in new age spirituality and mysticism is new age and witchcraft. Telling people to open themselves up to familiar spirits or hearing dead loved ones give you information while you're prophesying that's divination, that is witchcraft. And so our calling, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 12 through 13, Paul says, it's my responsibility to judge, it's not my responsibility to judge outsiders, but it certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church that are sinning. God will judge those on the outside, but the scripture says, you must remove the evil person from among you. So guys, absolutely biblical. Matthew 7 says, watch out for false teachers uh, they, in sheep's clothing. So we know that the devil's not going to come to us with horns. He's going to come acting like a preacher, acting like a pastor in sheep's clothing. And so we want to be able to discern these things. And then I just want to give two more verses and I'll pass it over to you guys. Um, 2 Corinthians 11 verses 3 through 5. It says, but I fear that somehow your pure and undivided devotion to Christ will be corrupted. Look at this, guys. Just as Eve would, was deceived by the serpent. So Paul says the same way the serpent came and deceived Eve, Paul says, I fear that you will also be corrupted in that same way. And then verse four of 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he says, you happily put up with what anyone tells you, even if they preach a different Jesus, a different yeah. spirit or a different gospel. Guys, we have to push back against these teachings. We can't be okay with false teachings, false gospel, heretical messages, false spirits, new age spirits. And then verse five, he says, I consider myself inferior to the super apostles 
who are teaching these things. And then I want to give you one more. This is 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. These people are false apostles. They are deceitful workers. They disguise themselves. Look at this, Pagani. They disguise themselves as apostles of Christ, but I'm not surprised. This is what Paul says. Even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it's yeah. no wonder that his servants, these are claiming to be apostles, also disguise themselves as servants of, of unrighteousness and the day or servants of righteousness and then end they will get the punishment their wicked deeds deserve. So I just wanted to touch on that, Mike. I don't know if you have thoughts about secondary versus primary. I know this is something people say, don't divide, brother. Don't bring division in the church. Witchcraft is something to divide over. It's something to avoid. If we know somebody is performing witchcraft, somebody has to speak out. Somebody has to say something about this because it's definitely not okay and it's not biblical. Yeah, I mean, listen, let me just put it like this. If you guys want to help, if I, if I can help you understand the importance of this teaching, if I told you I made the most incredible brownies that you're ever going to taste in your life, but I just dropped a little bit of feces in, in the brownie mix, <laughs> you, you would say, I don't want to take one bite. Because one ounce, one drop, one morsel of feces in the most incredible brownie mix you've ever had is still inedible. One little bit of witchcraft inside of the repertoire of a prophet who 98% of his ministry is legitimate, I don't want to receive from them. Mm. One, one iota of witchcraft from someone who's an apostolic ministry, I don't want to receive from them. And this is why it's so important. And we're going to really unpack this today. You know, Isaiah, I was thinking about Galatians chapter three. There was a church and this church had, had become bewitched. Now, there was a faction of people called Judaizers. And for those of you who are taking notes, we're going to go deep right now. The Judaizers were presenting a gospel. It wasn't the gospel, but it was a gospel. A, a gospel. Here's the thing, though. They were probably helping them. They were probably operating in some measure of power. They were probably saying very compelling things that were moving people emotionally. But needless to say, Galatians chapter three, verse one, it says, you foolish Galatians. This is Paul. I mean, mm. Paul is going in. He says, who has bewitched you before your eyes? And, and see, the thing that we need to break down, because this word is only used once in the entire Bible. And when you look at bewitched in the Greek, it literally means to cast an evil spell to exercise evil power over someone. And here's another one, like putting them under a spell. And so these people operated under a false anointing that created the conditions that the apostle Paul had to come in and say, it's as if you are under their spell. And wow. so what you'll find is when people are operating in a form of witchcraft, they're going to do some things that are beneficial. They're going to operate in some measure of power, but the people underneath them will almost seem as if they are under a spell. As a matter of fact, um, Paul, Ooh, you're hitting it. I'm telling you, Paul, there'll be an unusual infatuation with this person. There'll be an unusual level of intrigue. There'll be an unusual level. It's almost like I only want to listen to them. I only want to hear what they have to say. And, and you'll start to see this. And when, when Paul was saying this, it was so important because in their particular culture, they believed that you would look at this, the eyes of a snake and those eyes would actually put you under a trance. And so he was using language that was appropriate within their cultural context to say, what's happening to you, it's, it's, it is supernatural. What's happening to you is spiritual. You need to diagnose it. And uh, these Judaizers, they're telling you a gospel, but not the gospel. Mm. And you know, you, you're already, you, you nailed it. And I wanna pass it over to Pagani. But the thing that I need you guys to understand is you're graduating levels. There's tens of thousands of people watching this right now. You're graduating levels. Level one, the devil was able to seduce you with drugs, alcohol, pornography. Wow. That would, the love, okay, level two, you enter into the spiritual realm, psychic mediums, occult practices, uh, sage, you know, burning sage and, you know, salt and, you know, Santeria. Okay, okay, now you're graduating levels. You come out of that. Now you're a Christian. Now it's false gospel. Now it's Christian witchcraft. Now, because what happens is, he, if, if I can't get you to stop serving Christ, I must give you a false Christ. Mm. And the only way he can distribute a false Christ is through a false prophet.
Mm. And so then what happens is you, you have to increase in your discernment so that you, you're not deceived in this level, just like you needed the Holy Spirit, just like you needed sound biblical teachings to take you through those levels and layers. Welcome to your next level right now, because we're helping you discern that you have been deceived again. The devil comes as an angel of light. And so how will you know the difference between an angel and an angel of light that's, that's masquerading as the devil? It's going to be the, the Holy Spirit. But let me just give you a warning because I'm feeling something and I, I just got to dig, on, Go dig in your on time. Come on. People who deceive other people are successful in their deception because they give the people what they want. Mm. They tell them what they want to hear. And what happens is you become self-deceived because you are trying to get something and they're enabling you and helping you get the thing that you already wanted. And so you know the red flags, you see the signs, but you ignore them because self-deception becomes the only path to possess the thing that you already wanted. And so Galatians, here's the thing. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. When you, go back, when you go back to Galatians, these Judaizers were saying, we know that you are paying a high cost to abandon some of the rituals connected to the Jewish tradition. And that's hurting your family relationships. That's hurting, it's straining some of the dynamics. So guess what? We can marry a works-based theology with grace and we can marry Judaism with Christianity. And that is where the false came. It was, let me give you what you already want. And so mm. the reason, and I'm spitting straight facts for somebody right now, the only reason why false prophets and Christian witchcraft exists is because those people in leadership are giving the people they're leading exactly what they want. And what happens is, I don't know how many times you can violate not just your conscience, but the voice of the Holy Spirit through you before you become dead to that voice. And I think what's at stake here is many of you guys, as we continue this teaching, will say, you know what? I did feel something was off. I did feel something mm. was wrong. But don't let your affinity for that person, don't let the fact that you identify with their story, their past, their history, their testimony, don't let the fact that they're the, the same color, the same geographic uh, region, don't let the package actually persuade you to, to uh, not identify what's inside the package. Just mm. because because it's put in the right, but with the bow around it, and it looks, feels, and sounds like you want, the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you. And when Paul shows up in Galatians chapter three, he says, you foolish Galatians. Another translation says, you idiot Galatians. That's that's how emphatic the, la the, the language was, who has bewitched you? And that Greek word says, you have come up under a spell. And think about this. What do they call us in social media? They call us influencers. Mm. I mean, you got to be very careful because there's two types of influence. There's the influence of the Holy Spirit that draws you closer to relationship with Christ. And then there's the influence of the things of the world, which behind it's demonic, but it'll always lead you closer to flesh. That's so good. No, Paul's warning to the Galatian church concerning a Christian being bewitched needs to be taken immensely serious. And you're probably saying, how could a Christian get bewitched? You know, I found that it's, at least as of recent, found in this one phrase, giving people the benefit of the doubt. Instead of listening to that intuition of the Holy Spirit on the inside, that warning flag telling you something is off here, we give people the benefit of the doubt because we assume that people are like us. Mm. You can never deceive somebody. You would never take their money. And we think everyone is like you. They, yes, will do it. Yes, they will take the money. Yes, they are deceiving someone. And sometimes this benefit of the doubt is found in this one phrase, oh, everybody misspeaks. I'm here to say that there's a difference between misspeaking and misrepresenting what mm. the scriptures actually say. There's a difference between misspeaking and misunderstanding. Watch this. If someone shares with you something that is a misunderstanding, then everyone who listens to them gets completely derailed, even though you love the Lord, even though you would say the Holy Spirit would never allow that. Let me ask this question. The Apostle Paul, Isaiah said something earlier in 2 Corinthians. He said this, that Eve was deceived yeah. by the cunning craftiness of the serpent. You know what's interesting about that story? Eve was deceived in a perfect environment.
Mm. Eve was deceived in a place of anointing. Eve was deceived in the Garden of Eden with nothing there. Imagine you and I that are not in the Garden of Eden. We're surrounded by sinful flesh. We're surrounded by the world, the flesh, and the devil. So I think what we're trying to do today is help you break out of the naive, the, 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 the being naive. Yep, and so yep. even though I have the Holy Spirit living on the inside, I can be corrupted. I can fall. I can be bewitched. I can be led astray. I can fall into seducing spirits and doctrines and demons. And this is why we are here to help unbewitched you. So yeah. that's what you to do strap on your seatbelt because we're going to keep going deeper and deeper in and one more thing i want to say we're not just talking in broad generalities concerning false teachers we are talking also about the false teachers within the fivefold false apostles and false prophets within the apostolic and the prophetic we're not talking about all the secondary guru new age influencers that come from the outside that probably aren't christian right actually talking about that which is within the body of Christ, within this current apostolic and prophetic movement, the current fivefold that I believe nobody has addressed because we keep labeling false teachers to uh, David Koresh and Jim Jones, where there is a new Jim Jones. There is a new David Koresh that are amongst us, and this is what we're going to confront and tackle with today. So let's start with the first thing. What is the teachings happening out here? These are teachings that have been confirmed. These are being taught in Christian churches. I just had someone today tell me, I just went through schooling for that exact class, learning about that. Thank God, God brought me out of it. The first one we're going to tackle is the third eye, is opening your third eye in these Christian churches, in these prophetic schools. They're teaching people how to open the third eye. This is textbook witchcraft. So let me give you guys a breakdown According to Wikipedia, which is where people go for their information on these things, what is the third eye? This is not a Christian website, by the way. I want to make sure you guys aren't like, you got that from a Christian. This is a secular website that gives information that says this is what this is. The third eye, also called the mind's eye or the inner eye, is a mystical invisible eye. Now, after I read this, I want you guys in the chat to tell me if you think this is appropriate for the church. I want you to tell me if you think this is appropriate to be taught. It's a mystical eye depicted as located on the forehead, which provides perception beyond the sight. In Hinduism, the third eye refers to the ajna or the chakra, the brow chakra. In both Hinduism and Buddhism, the third eye is located in the middle of the forehead, slightly above the eyebrows, representing enlightenment through meditation. Already starting to sound demonic to me. The third eye refers to the gate that leads to the inner realms and the spaces of higher consciousness. By the way, this is all new age if you guys aren't catching this. In spirituality, yep. the third eye represents a state of enlightenment. It's also associated with religious visions, clairvoyance, observing chakras and auras, precognition and out-of-body experiences. Hindus place a talaka between the eyebrows representing the third eye, which is also an expression of Shiva. And if you guys don't know who Shiva is, Shiva literally translates to the auspicious one, also known as the Mahadeva, the great God, who's one of the principal deities of Hinduism. He's the supreme being. He's the mate within a major tradition of Hinduism. Shiva is known as the destroyer within Trimurti, the Hindu trinity. So this is the Hindu trinity now we're talking about when it comes to the third eye and Shiva. The Hindu trinity includes Brahma, Vishnu, and uh, in Shavit tradition. Shiva is the supreme lord. Shiva creates, protects, transforms the universe, and is the goddess-oriented Shakta tradition. The supreme goddess is regarded as the energy and the creative power equally the partner of Shiva. Shiva is one of the five eloquent de uh, equivalent deities in the smarter tradition of Hinduism. Okay, so the, the, the third eye is relating to Shiva, which is the destroyer, the God of the universe. And this is something absolutely the devil's counterfeit to God opening up our spiritual eyes. Now, can God open up our spiritual eyes? Yes, but teaching on the third eye is demonic it is new age it should be avoided and let's just guys we haven't said this yet but let's just say this these things open you to demons these things are open doors to demonic spirits coming into you we are out here guys we just put out a movie pastor greg about pastor greg's lock story about getting involved in deliverance and casting out demons we are out here working all that we can to drive out demons meanwhile there's ministers of unrighteousness bringing demons into people giving demonic prophecies, opening up third eyes. If you start learning about the third eye, you will realize and go down the route of new age. And this leads right. to a whole bunch of other things. Yes, God can open your spiritual eyes, just like in 2 Kings 6, where Elisha prayed, Lord, open the servant's eyes. 
but to teach on the third eye is not biblical. Now, some would say, well, what about in Matthew where it talks about the eye? Stop the cap. That is not the third eye. Matthew 6, <laughs> your eye is a lamp that provides light to your body. Do not tell me that Jesus was teaching on the third eye. Jesus was not teaching on the third eye. So this is a very dangerous teaching. It's demonic. It is a counterfeit of what God wants to do. And we need, guys, we need to push back as hard as we can against the third eye because it's slowly creeping into the church along with other things we'll cover. What are your guys' thoughts generally on this whole third eye teaching? Um, Pastor Mike, what would you say with someone listening right now? Because I know what they're thinking. That's not what we mean when we say third mm. eye. Third eye means prophetic. We mean third eye, God is opening your level of understanding. Pastor Mike, what would you say to the, that group of individuals that believe that that's not what we're meaning when we're talking about third eye? The devil thrives off of ambiguity. When he showed up in the garden and he whispered the lie to Eve, he was living in ambiguity. You won't die. And so here's what happens. The same ministers who want to live in that ambiguity are trying to build a bridge between two worlds so that they can win with two audiences. I just called a spade a spade. Go ahead. I'm telling you straight up, I don't care how much don't hate I back. get, y'all can tag me in the comments section. When you talk about the third eye, you are living in the ambiguity of I can justify it with scriptures and then I can also accumulate new age audience. So therefore I can have an audience that's twice as big. So listen, Jesus' goal wasn't to build an audience, it was to thin it out. When his crowds got too big, he said hard things like drink my blood and eat my flesh. And then the, they said people actually walked away from him. Just like, I'm not trying to grow my church, I'm trying to shrink it down to the real ones. Give me Gideon's army. But when you're the kind of minister that wants to build an audience, you will thrive off of ambiguity and you will use terms and phrases that you can justify to both communities, and that is that is representative of the double-mindedness that we have rooted in the demonic. The other thing I want to say, and I want to kick it back to you, Apostle, those who chase power, instead of the person who's the source of all power, will fall prey to these types of teachings. Mm. And I've seen it. Guys, I've been in the charismatic movement. I've been in Pentecostalism. Pagani and I can tell you, we've given prophetic words for the last decade that have been syndicated from Charisma News, Elijah List, and every other major Christian publication over and over and over again. We're well-respected within the prophetic realm. Isaiah Saldivar, same thing, viral prophecy after viral prophecy, but we don't chase power. We are in pursuit of the source of all power. We want Jesus Christ, and wherever you find Jesus, you'll find his breath and his voice, and we're, we're listening to his heart heartbeat and we're going to hear his voice as well and and this whole third eye thing it's preying on two types of people it's preying on people who are in the pursuit of power without the pursuit of the person who is the source of all power jesus christ and it's preying on people new age people who like the idea that they are accessible and relatable and, and again we're going to get to this later on in this teaching but there is a carnality there is a fruits of the flesh aspect of this where you are seeing a materialism and you're seeing the desire for to be liked, the desire mm. to be accepted and embraced by a wider audience. And here's what happens in trying to win everybody, you lose everything. And wow. so you're going to have to offend some people with the word of God and stand, uh, you know, stand on, on these principles and you can't live in the ambiguity. And this teaching tonight is simply us talking, like you said, Apostle, not, not to the sinners, not to the gurus, but to the Christians who are yes. and the, the Christian leaders who are acting like gurus, because terms like spiritual instinct, my sixth sense, ESP, psychic abilities. These are the terms of the world. We are not to embrace Come those on, terms. Pastor. We are not to co-op those terms. We Come are on. not to, we, you don't have the right to rebrand something that was born in the bowels of hell. Come you don't on. have the right to give it a, an update and a new logo and a color scheme and then package it and sell it. You don't have a right to do that. I want to echo in the 21st century, the first century apostolic epistles. I want to echo the voice of the Holy Spirit spirit, not the voice of a demonic spirit. And so all these things that I'm telling you guys right now, this is what we need to make go viral in the kingdom, not that mess that has been rippling through prophetic communities. So Pagani, I, 
Just stop no, me while those I'm Those demons there. are going to come out tonight. Let me just, real quick, let me just say, I hear the Holy Spirit saying those demons that came in through the third eye and through these new age, you've given to these prophetic schools where they teach the third eye, those demons are coming out tonight. At the end of this, guys, don't let yes. me forget, we are going to pray mass deliverance. We're going to drive out every demonic, foul, vile, unclean spirit that has entered into you through false yeah. teaching and new age practices. These demons are going to leave you. Some of you have been all confused, all stressed out. You don't know what is going on. Ever since I got involved in this ministry, it is witchcraft, it's mind control, it's new age, it's demonic, and it's fleshly. And tonight, in Jesus' mighty name, every foul spirit is going to leave you tonight. All those demons that have been deceiving you, lying to you, tricking you, manipulating you, they're going to leave. There's power. We're not just talking about the problem tonight. We are going to violently drive out every foul spirit that's attached itself to you. And some of you that have been in that mind control, that can, which, because that's what witchcraft does, it dominates, yeah. it mind controls you. We're going to break that tonight. Uh, you know, Galatians 5.19 says witchcraft, I just want to tie into what you said, Mike, is the work of the flesh. Okay. The Bible says the works of the yeah. flesh are this, adultery. And guys, I want to note something. Isn't it the case when these guys that are teaching this start getting involved in witchcraft? All the sins I'm about to mention start happening. They start, their marriage starts falling apart. They start cheating. They start getting involved wow. in money. They start getting involved in scandals. Watch how all these sins come together. These sins are evident. Look at this, Galatians 5, the works of the flesh. Adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, sexual wow. jokes from the pulpit. Can we just say, be honest there? Idolatry, mm -hmm. sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions. Uh, I want to stop on all of these, but I'm going to keep going. I got to be careful here. <laughs> Dissensions, division, heresies, envy, drunkenness, murder, mm. revelries, mm. and all of these things I tell you, just as I told you before, if you practice these things, and again, one of those things is witchcraft, sorcery, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Some translations say sorcery, divination, or witchcraft. But yeah. I, guys, what I've noticed is when preachers start getting involved in this teaching, they start doing all these other sins. You start seeing an, an exaltation of self. You start seeing selfish ambition. Heresies start slowly being taught. Envy, division, drunkenness, uh, sexual jokes from the pulpit. These things all tie in. If you look at some of these guys, and again, we're not mentioning names tonight, that are preaching what we're talking about, they start telling sexual jokes. They make sexual remarks. They make sexual Instagram posts. This is all part of the sins of the flesh. Leviticus 19.26, you shall not eat anything with blood or practice divination. Give no regard to mediums or familiar spirits. Do not seek them. Do not be defiled by them. Leviticus 20, and the person who turns to mediums or familiar spirits prostitutes himself with them. I will set my face against that wow. person and cut them off from my people. Guys, this is no, this is no joke. This is no game. This is a serious matter here that is being taught in the church. And tonight, praise the Lord, there's 9,000 live right now. We're going to break 10,000 tonight. There's 9,000. We are blowing the trumpet saying, this has to stop. If your pastor's teaching this, if your leaders are, if the people you follow are teaching this, unsubscribe. This is not yeah. secondary. Unfollow. There's an urgency. This is a Joel to blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm. Guys, we've been doing this for years, but it's, forever more important right now because it's happening right under our noses and should guys should we just sit back as the demon slayers as the guys that are calling out how are we I, let me just go here for one second pagani i'll toss it to you hey, yeah, how are we going to call out celebrities how are we going to be oh jay-z's doing witchcraft oh look at this we're calling out all these companies all these commercials all these celebrities taylor swift and liquid death and kanye west all these people like look at them doing witchcraft we blow up their stuff i do too I make the same videos of all these people and then we let witchcraft happen right under our nose. And then we partner with people that are openly doing witchcraft, openly practicing witchcraft. Guys, we, I'm sorry, but some of y'all are drunk on the wine of the church. We need to sober up. Wow. We've gotten drunk and it's time as the body of Christ. I hear the Holy Spirit saying, sober up, open your eyes. Don't tolerate witchcraft. Why have you allowed it to bewitch you? So no, this will never in a million years be okay, no matter what anyone says. These violate scriptural principles. We've already given you tons of scripture, but witchcraft is definitely infiltrating the church. Go ahead, Pagani. I'm sorry, I cut it. I cut right in front of you there, but I just felt I had to say that. You know, um, Isaiah mentioned something earlier concerning Luke chapter 11. Let's drive this whole eye, this whole eye concept. So 
He's, the scripture says in Luke 11, if your eye, you know, if your eye be single. Now, I want to show you the sequence of how this works. So let's establish that the word eye in scripture is talking about understanding. Where is our understanding? It's found in our mind, mm. right? So therefore, this is why we get mind's eye or whatever the case, whatever the case may be. But let me show you the sequence of scripture. Mm. Jesus first said that the eye, if it's only single, will cause your whole body to be filled with light. Good. Now watch, watch the number sequence. Once your mind goes into double-mindedness, instability kicks in. Yeah. See, how, see how it's working? By the time it gets to the third eye, it's demonic. Did you catch what I just said? That's the sequence. Single, one, two, double-mindedness. By the time it gets to third eye, your whole body is filled with darkness. Wow. So let me show you this. The Bible specifically says, watch this. For those of you that think, you know, ain't nothing wrong with third eye. Well, the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible actually says we walk by faith and not by sight. Wow. So, so the moment you open your third eye, you're actually deactivating faith. Second thing I want to say is this. Jesus said, blessed are those who don't see yet believe. <laughs> Do you see how this works? So by the, so you go from singleness of mind, mind's oh. eye, body filled with light. Because singleness in scripture means wholeness. Nothing missing, nothing broken. It falls in line with salvation. Salvation means wholeness, deliverance, right? But James says, that a double-minded man or a double eye is unstable. Watch this. The person with a double mind is driven by the wind, watch this, and by the waves, which means by the time you go from single to double, now you're dealing with the marine kingdom. Mm. I mean, now the waters are coming in and therefore you're tossed to and fro like a wave. And by the time it creeps on over to the third level, it is completely demonic. The last thing I want to say this, and I'll pass this, is this. And we're saying this as the demon slayers. If you hold us to be the gatekeepers, we're making a clarion call to every content creator and everybody out there. Breach against the third eye and don't worry about the repercussions. God got your back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet in Zion. Let the people know, do not stop. Be a battering ram. You don't need to pray about it no more. Take this as a confirmation that God is saying, open your mouth because I've already been talking to you. Let my people know their transgression because us three can't do it alone. We mm. need you to rise up. Man, Mike, I'm getting excited, man. Talk Come to me. Come on. Somebody throw a fire emoji in the chat right now. I gotta see this this thing go crazy. I, I just I feel such a strong anointing on this broadcast. This teaching is anointed. I want to say too because this hasn't been addressed with the third eye, and I'm sure we're gonna move on. But Isaiah, you had mentioned that there is a connection to the pineal gland, and you're seeing a lot of this this happening right now, especially on YouTube. People are like very obsessed with the physical connection to the spiritual realm and you know as you had mentioned there's this spot on our forehead where this third eye is being activated that's the belief behind it and there's a connection to the pineal gland and so again you do have these false prophets and these people within christianity who are trying to create these physical phenomena physical experiences with the spiritual and just like you said apostle it's it's opening up to mass deception and what we're doing is saying instead of relying on the holy spirit Instead of relying on faith, which is not seeing, we are trying to increase people's ability to have these perceptual experiences. But let me just say this, and I, I waited to drop this because this is going to extend off of what you said, Apostle. False prophets, they advance false teachings through accuracy. Mm. But accuracy is about access, not about authority. Demons give, demons give access to information, but we must only operate within the authority of Christ. So accuracy is about access, not about authority. So just because somebody opens up their third eye, teaches you how to open up your third eye, and is accurate, accurate is about access. 
I mean, the devil knows information because there's, you know, when they said we are legion, they were saying we are highly organized. The devil operates within highly organized divisions globally. Sometimes I wish that the body of Christ would actually be more organized than the demonic kingdom. But the, mm. the fact is, psychic mediums, the third eye, they all whether it's coming through the lens of somebody who calls themselves a prophet or someone who calls themselves a psychic, it's about access to information, not about authority. And so do not, and I just felt led to say this, do not fall prey to these third eye teachings because the people propagating these teachings are accurate because accurate and authority is two different domains. Come and on. so it's, that's what I'm trying to help you understand. Stop being so impressed. I think that's going back where it's like Paul is saying you've been bewitched because you're impressed with how accurate they are. Stop being impressed by accuracy and start learning how to discern authority. Man, come, come on. on. That is for somebody. That'll breach. Come you on. Know? Because even a true prophet of God will be inaccurate sometimes because we're human. And so mm. accuracy is not the barometer of whether or not you're you're in or out of the kingdom. All of us see in part. All of us say and do things. Accuracy is not necessarily always the litmus test. And I think some of you guys, this, this is one of those teachings, and this is why you got to keep sharing it, is because this is one of those teachings that are graduating you in levels yes. to be like, wow, the, the immature version of me was wild because someone was accurate. Now wow. I'm able, able to discern whether or not they're flowing in true kingdom authority. There's a difference. So good. We're going to move into the next heretical teaching, but I want to first shout out Jenny Weaver and Steven Weaver, core group in the house. We are on, I should have said this earlier, I apologize, but we're live also on Jenny Weaver's page. She so graciously asked us to be live on her page as well. So shout out to Jenny's platform, everyone on Facebook on Jenny's page and the core group. You guys are awesome. You and Steven love and appreciate you guys. Okay. The next teaching is astral projection. This is being taught or called, they disguise it as spirit travel. They talk about traveling in the spirit. Um, I want to first say before I go into what astral projection is for all the new people is that a good friend of ours, Leon Dupree recently made an apology video on a very old clip where he talked about, well, he didn't talk about astral projection, but he talked about being somewhere in the spirit. And somebody took his clips, chopped him up, and he made an apology video. He humbled himself. He said, look, I misspoke. It's on his YouTube channel. You can go find it. So I want to make sure that as I say this, you guys are not spamming, oh, Leon, this or that. I want to just make sure that his name is clear because he's made an apology video on something that he misspoke about, but it wasn't him saying he astral projected. It was, it was him talking about being in the spirit. But again, you can go on his channel and find that whole video of his apology. So I want to make sure I say that so that it doesn't cause any division where it doesn't need to be. So astral projection is the name given to having an astral body, which separates from the physical body. The astral body, also called the etheric body or your spirit body, is the believed to be essentially your human soul, the part that makes you feel, think, and all that. In a nutshell, when you disconnect your soul from your body and roam in the spirit realm, or people call it an out-of-body experience, this is astral projection and it's incredibly dangerous, but I want you guys to note what I'm gonna say here. It's incredibly dangerous to force yourself out of your body. Let me say that again. It is incredibly dangerous to force yourself into an out-of-body experience. Now, was there out-of-body experiences in the Bible? Yes, but this was something God controlled, God initiated, and God did. The danger comes, and I'm talking slow for some of you sitting in the back tonight, the danger <laughs> comes when you force your own spirit out of your body. This is used in the occult, where witches fight other witches, they invade homes, they invade places, somewhere a physical body wouldn't have access to, a witch will go on and spy on people and stalk people. So, John has an out-of-body experience being in the spirit in the book of Revelation, but who initiated that encounter? God initiated the encounter. Ezekiel, Ezekiel 3.14 says, the spirit lifted me and took me away. Ezekiel 8.3, the spirit lifted me between heaven and earth and he saw visions of God in Jerusalem. Ezekiel 11.24, the spirit brought me out of my body in a vision. Uh, so these are biblical, but God did this. God took the spirit out. And let me just read you guys before I turn it over, an excerpt from a friend of mine, Stephen Bankars. He's an ex-New Ager. He has a book on the New Age dangers and he talks like this about astral projection. Look at this. 
And this is what Stephen Bankar says. He says, anyone in the new age has a lot of experience with astral projection and is well aware it's not all fun and games to be outside of your body. While it's often advertised as a free, floaty, supernatural experience, it's also common knowledge, look at this, that the astral right. realm is full of demons. These entities are called trickster entities or negative astral entities instead of demons, but they bear the same traits and behaviors. Books, articles, and videos that teach you how to astral project provide a list of ways that you can protect yourself against these things, such as visualizing white light around you, loving on the demons until they leave you alone, or speaking positive affirmations over yourself before bedtime. A big hint often offered is to make sure you're not operating from a place of fear, since fear be is believed in the new age to attract demons. The demons aren't the cause of fear, demons are responding to fear. These, also, these sources also coach us into thinking that demons can only do what we allow them to do, but this is what Steven says, None of this is true. The internet is full of testimonies or people that have been tormented by demons because they've been, out, they've been traveling outside their body. Both the authors of this book have had several astral projection experiences against their will. He says, I, Stephen, was suggested to take perfect, uh, protective measures while I'm out of my body, but I still was tormented and, and, and violation by these spirits. Demons mocking God by having to read the Bible being tormented. Demons disguising themselves as romantic partners. Demons violating and tormenting. Demons paralyzing against their own will. Astral parasites are demons who attach themselves to your soul and enter your body when you return to the natural realm. Okay, Stephen is saying, don't astral project in the new age. They teach it all fun, all nice. This is dangerous. I just heard a new teaching literally this week. I won't, again, I'm not going to call names out. He's, he's in the chat right now. He's watching this video right now. But he starts saying, you could just ascend to heaven at any time. You can leave your body. Your spirit can go to heaven and the throne at any time you want. Guys, this is not biblical. This is not New Testament. Paul said, I went to the third heaven and I wouldn't even talk about what I saw. This wasn't a daily experience. Now, can God, and I'm just covering my tracks here, can God take your spirit out of your body if he wants to? Of course. Did this happen in the Bible even with Paul? Yes. This was not astral projection. This was not a spirit travel the way some of these prophetic and apostles are teaching it. This was God initiating it. The New Age says you can do it on your own will. The Bible says God is the one that takes you out of your body. Going to heaven on a daily basis in the spirit is not biblical, guys. I don't care what you say. It's not found in the New Testament, and we need to be careful because as you go into the spirit realm, you might think it's all fun and games. You're going to encounter demons. And when you come back into your body, guess what happens? You have friends that come with you. And those friends, those critters, they jump on board. And now you end up at our services saying, I got a demon because this prophet taught me how to astral project. So astral projection's a big no. What are your guys' general thoughts on astral projection or spirit travel? Well, I think you already kind of covered it, uh, Isaiah, but I want to speak to the crowd of people because I don't know if you guys get this a lot, but people reaching out to our ministry with people or preachers and prophets and apostles threatening people that leave their church or people that yes. are in ministry saying that they're going to astral project into their homes to do some kind of harm. The next time that somebody tells you that, you tell them, I want to see you try to come <laughs> in my house because I'll cut the silver cord in a heartbeat. I want the body of Christ. Don't be fearful of these super fake bootleg apostles. They lying going in your house. You want to know why they ain't going in your house? Because the angel of the Lord encamps around them that fear the Lord. Come I want on. a witch try to come in this house at three o'clock in the morning. Because if I see her, I'm going to be like, oh, it's you. Can you tuck me in, please? And go get me a cup of water. What I'm trying to tell you is this. No more fear with all of these fake threats, this fake manipulation of people coming into your house and shaking up stuff, talking about, I'm going to go to your house. The devil is a liar. As for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. And another thing, they lying. That's just Come a on. fear to get you to submit. They're not going in your house. Apostle and prophet saying that, you know you lying. You just mad. People could disagree with you and they can leave your ministry. Stop with these fake curses. God ain't killing nobody for you. God ain't uh, causing people to lose their jobs for you. Stop it. We could disagree with you and we could touch God's anointed and nothing is going to happen. Why? Because an anointed can touch another anointed. We need to stop this bullying, all this 
this foolishness about? You're going to leave our ministry in six months. Something's going to have to, as a matter of fact, in six months, our ministry was blessed. Your family was blessed. As a matter of fact, when you ran like Kunta Kinte off that spiritual father and mother plantation and they gave you six months to die, in six months, God radically blessed your life. So do me a favor. No more fear and no more being intimidated by these lies because Romans chapter 12 says to the believer, curse not, but provide blessing. So you come fake on, a stop your foolishness because you know you lying. That's all I had to come say. On. Man. Come on with it. Come on. What do you think about <laughs> astral projection, Pastor? Hey, man, come on. Listen, well, listen, I got to say, stop prophesying out of the wrong covenant. Some of y'all are prophesying out of the wrong covenant. That's a whole nother teaching, but you're right. And here's the thing. This astral projection, I believe, is connected to a monitoring spirit. Mm. It's connected to voyeurism. Why in the world? The Bible says to be absent Ew. from the body is to be present with the Lord. So if you think that you're going to leave your physical body and you are now going to be, begin to travel, there's an element of fantasy, an element of escapism, voyeurism, monitoring spirits. The motive behind the desire to even do it is wrong in and of itself. And I just want to say straight up, again, what I'm going to keep coming back to, the only reason why these false prophets and Christian warlocks and witches calling themselves apostles and prophets even have a career on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Telegram is because they help people get the twisted, carnal, perverted desires they want, and they try to do it through a means they're calling spiritual. Isaiah, you had mentioned Revelation chapter four, verse one. I'm just going to read it. It says, after these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I will show you the things which must take place after this. The question is, did God prompt it or did I? Mm. Who is the source of this experience? And again, what this all comes down to is not my will, but thy will. You want to become a true prophet? Learn that phrase. If you're the one prompting the experience, you're not a servant. You're expecting the Holy Spirit to serve you. Come on. I'm giving somebody two slaps and a hug right now, right into their next level. It's like, did you prompt it or did the Holy Spirit? Are you serving him or are you expecting him to serve you? As a matter of fact, what is witchcraft? It's using spirits to do your bidding. Yes. It's using the spiritual realm to do your bidding. And homie, don't nobody believe that God is working for you. He's called called us to surrender all for him. And a lot of times what happens is a lot of this false theology is perpetuated by people that are selfish leading other selfish people. And so again, mm -hmm. who's prompting it? And, and I think really at the end of the day, I live here in New York City, astral projection is happening. It's rampant. People are engaging in those things. Um, but at the end of the day, and I heard the story over and over again, because my New York City campus, my Long Island campus, every single Sunday, we are delivering people from demons who said, I went on an astral trip. <laughs> I took a trip and that I never wish I would have taken. And I was deceived. And the demons that I thought that I, that were working for me actually turned on me. The wow. spirits that I thought were benevolent were malevolent. And so here's the thing, go ahead, pay your $999, pay your $4,999, pay your $777 and 77 cents a month, do the e course, do the transcendental meditation, do your astral projection. I'll see you at church on Sunday for deliverance once the trip is over. Come on, come on. You guys are both dropping bombs. So no to astral projection. What are some other new age practices that we're seeing enter the church? I just want to touch on uh, one, well, it's two, but it's one put together. It's astrology and horoscopes. This is something that is becoming more popular. The definition of astrology is the divination of supposed influences of the stars and planets on human affairs and terrestrial events by their position and aspects. So astrology is becoming very popular, taught in the church. And then horoscopes is a forecast of a person's future, typically including a delineation of a character and circumstances based on the position of planets and stars at the time of the person's birth. Now, some of you might be saying, what's the big deal? Without a doubt, the Bible teaches that God not only created the stars, but he also created their patterns. In the book of Job, we read that God is the maker of the bear and Orion, the Pleiades, and the constellations of the south. 
So the problem is when you begin to worship creation, when you begin to look at creation and look to the stars to guide you and to direct you, you start getting involved in astrology. Now, some of you are like, I'm confused. We're not talking about astronomy. Astronomy is the study of the stars, okay? Astrology is when you attempt to look for hidden knowledge and you begin to literally worship and praise and look to stars yeah. that hold some type of power. So we need to be careful that we don't get involved in this. If you look at Isaiah 47, 10 through 15, it says, you've trusted in your wickedness, your wisdom and knowledge mislead you, disaster will come upon you, you will not know how to conjure it away. Keep on then with your magic spells, with your many sorceries. Let your astrologers come forward. Let those stargazers predict the month by month. They are like stubble and the fire will burn them up. They cannot even save themselves. Each one of them goes off in his own error. So the Bible mm -hmm. says, look, God is condemning stargazers, astrologers, worshipers of planet. If you are a Christian in the chat, we're at 9,500 guys, we're right there on the cusp of 10,000. If you are a Christian in the chat and you are a horoscope and what is he, is he cancer? How are you gonna say so-and-so's cancer? Why are we talking about so-and-so's Leo, so-and-so's cancer? I don't want no, the only thing I'm doing with cancer is casting it out in Jesus' name. Come on. So when you get involved in astrology and reading, and let us let me just touch on one more since I'm here, yoga. What is, what are y'all doing out here with yoga? The word yoga literally means union. It means to unite yourself with the infinite Brahman, which is the Hindu concept of God. So yoga cannot be redeemed. It's just like the Ouija board. You go, well, I'm just playing for fun. I'm just doing yoga. I'm just doing the double dog, triple dragon on the beach. It's no big deal. No, you are doing prayer stances to Hindu gods. And it doesn't matter if you have good intentions. It's demonic. You're opening yourself up to demons. That's why in yoga they say namaste. That means I bow to the divine in you. Okay? This is all demonic. This is not of God. These are prayer stances to foreign gods. Let me just, I'm on a roll. Let me go one more here. Universalism. Oh, all it's roads on. lead to God. Universalism. All roads yeah. lead to heaven. Everyone is saved. God is so loving. How could he send anyone to hell? This is universalism. There's no wrath when there's no hell. And the Bible says in Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all of those in ungodliness and unrighteousness by who unrighteousness suppress the truth. John 3.36, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. One more, meditation, new age meditation. It focuses on self, tapping into the subconscious mind. If you hear guys teaching a lot on meditating, on energy, source energy, gaining source energy, tapping into the subconscious mind, emptying out your mind, this is new age. This is Christian yeah. new age, literally. Now, should we meditate? Yes. Let me show you what it says in the Bible, Joshua 1.8. Keep this book on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful and every, that you do everything that's written in it so you'll be prosperous and successful. Psalms 1.1, blessed is the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight in the law of the Lord, who meditates on the law day and night. That person is like a tree planted by the water which yields its fruit in seasons and its leaves do not wither, they prosper. Psalms 119, 115, meditate on your, pre precept, your precepts and consider your ways. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brothers, whatever's noble, true, right, pure, lovely, mm -hmm. admirable, think about these things. So should we meditate on God? Yes, literally on God, we should be meditating. But the new age meditation on unlocking your soul. And guys, let me just be frank here. Some of these pro apostles and prophets, they talk a lot about meditation. The Bible talks about it, I think, four or five times. That's all we hear about meditation. Should we meditate on God? Yes. But when you start doing full, all of these teachings about meditating and tapping into energy and the right vibes and the right frequencies and the Come right on. atmospheres and signaling, you know, your hairs are antennas that signal to God. Guys, I just heard this this last week. This is demonic. This is new age. This is new age. This is, as Mike said earlier, the feces in the brownie. If, you, if there was a little bit of feces in the brownie, you wouldn't eat it, yet you're eating this content, not realizing it's polluted. Jezebel has polluted the waters. And we've and this is what the indictment was. You've allowed Jezebel to teach. You've tolerated her. And we tonight are saying, Jezebel, get out of our waters. We are not tolerating you any longer. We will not let the men of God in this generation get their hair cut at Delilah's barbershop. We will not check out Bathsheba while she bathes on the roof. We are setting a holy standard as preachers of holiness saying, do not allow these new age practices. Meditation, universalism, 
all of these, the law of attraction. All right, I'm done. All of these things that we're letting in the church, tarot cards, angel cards, angel boards, Holy Spirit boards. What is going on out here? The streets are wild. What are we doing? And then, and then pastors are preaching about this. Guys, I mean, I, don't, I didn't like your series on the night at the movies, but that was better than the new age teachings you're doing, okay? Your stuff was lukewarm before, but it's better than the new age of teaching on bringing this in and bringing in. You're like, I had a Christian yoga class at church. What do you even mean? <laughs> Guys, you can stretch. No one's saying you can't stretch, but don't be doing namaste, double dog, trickle, triple dragon hey, idea. in the church, in the, in the church, you're opening doors, gaining opulence and popularity with celebrities. That's what all of this is, Mike. You already said earlier, it's gaining opulence and popularity with a new age crowd, which is let's be honest, the celebrities, the people that have money. When all these celebrities start liking your pastor, uh, that's a bit sus to me. That's how you know some of this stuff is seeping in. One of you guys, any any other new age practices, and then we're gonna go into abuses when ministering, and that's gonna be spicy. But is there any other new age practices that you guys wanna jump in here and tag in? Well, one new age practice that we're seeing within the Christian church is replacement, replacing words to mean something else. Mm. Galatians chapter four, verse three says, even so we, when we were children, we were in bondage under the elements of the world. That word elements is where you and I get the word fundamental or the fundamental building blocks. To replace that, it is the laws that make this universe work. So what happens is now we're using elemental wording and substituting it with words. Let me give you an example. So Go ahead. Law, law of attraction, we're calling it manifestation because that's in scripture. Influence, we're saying it's anointing. Um, we, frequency, so we'll say things like this. The frequency of the Holy Spirit is in the house. No, how about the person of the Holy Spirit <laughs> is in the house, not a frequency. Yeah. We'll say things like this, the force of faith. No, it's the word of faith which Come we on. preach. What happens is these fundamental building blocks or these laws and principles that govern the universe that are neutral, they're neither demonic or godly. It's rather whoever works it, it will work. Did you catch what I just said? So what happens is we take those terminologies and we incorporate them and we Christianize them. We put Christian jargon on them. So now we use influence and we say, it's the anointing. So now we're doing, we're waving over people and we're saying, you know, it's the anointing, but rather it's a manipulation of people using the laws of influence. And I'm mm. talking. So <laughs> people don't know this. They'll say, wow, that person is under the anointing. Look at what happened. No, they're being manipulated and bewitched by the laws of influence or the frequency of faith. The Holy Spirit is in the house. I feel the frequency, the vibration. So vibration is substituted with presence. Come on. I'm here to say that these terms are demonic and you need to run. And it's nothing different than what the Catholic Church did. They took all the godly, the ungodly idols and they put Christian Christian names on them. That's all we're seeing. We're seeing these fundamental powers of the age to come that Hebrews 6 talks about. And all they're doing is, is they're Christianizing them and now they're using it. And because most Christians don't read their Bible, they'll think it's the anointing, but really it's the laws of influence. They'll think it's faith, but really it's a force. They'll think it's a mm -hmm. vibration. They'll think it's power, but it really, it's a vibration. They'll think it's the Holy Spirit, but really it's a frequency. And wow. then what is those things get caught in video and because people come from dry churches that never seen the power wow. of God how would you know what is not the power of God if you don't have a power of God that you have a witness to parallel it so we'll embrace and say and people will fight you on it saying no that's the annoying thing and we're looking at saying that's the laws of influence being used to control somebody did you catch what I just said I wanted to throw that in there before we go into the next point. So good. So good. Dropped a bomb. Mike, go ahead and follow that oh, up. Good. Any other Listen, new age I mean, teachings? 
Yeah, you all just nuked that. I just want to bring one because we covered manifesting. We covered the law of attraction. We covered the power of positive thinking. But there's one that I think is going under the radar too easily, and it's the Enneagram and personality tests yes. within the church. And let me just say, people have tried to take the Enneagram and say, oh, you know, it's it's uh, rooted in, you know, different pagan, you know, roots or whatever. And none of that stuff has been um, established or substantiated. But I will tell you, we need to stop taking so much credence in what these personality diagnosis and these personality tests tell us. We don't need a test. We need a transformation. Mm. And a lot of these churches we're going to, it's like, I know in a lot of circles, the Enneagram is elevated above what God's word says about your wow. personality. And people are memorizing their Enneagram results, but they've never, they've never actually memorized the results of the cross. Like what did, wow. what did Christ say is possible for my personality versus what does the Enneagram say about my personality? So am I saying that the Enneagram was created by, you know, this ritualistic satanic experience? None of that has been substantiated. But what I am saying is personality inventories and personality tests have infiltrated the local church and you got people putting more stock in what a test says about them than what the word of God says about me. I'm introverted by nature. I got 10,000 people listening to me talk right now, but Acts chapter one, verse eight says, after the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will receive power to be a witness, not power to build your own empire, not power to be a successful entrepreneur and fulfill your own desires to get a house with a white picket fence, which I call a white picket prison, you know, not not necessarily to do what you will because manifestation law of attraction power of positive thinking it wow. all comes back to one thing wow. it's you receiving tools and mm. assets to fulfill your own selfish desires the kingdom is the opposite of that after the holy spirit comes upon you you will receive power to be witnesses and you might end up getting killed witnessing to other people it was a complete paradigm shift you know wow. and so i think a lot of this new age teaching that's infiltrating the church it's it's secular humanistic worldview it's disney mantra every disney movie is the same movie y'all it starts out with a character Character, they sing a song called an I want song. They express a desire. Then they go on a first person journey to realize that they already had the power inside of themselves that they had to unlock to get the thing that they wanted at the beginning of the movie. That is the plot of every Disney movie ever. And you got Christians that have been brainwashed with Disney ideology that don't understand the gospel. And the only reason, here's the thing, it's not, the only reason why these new age teachings would thrive in the church is because the pulpit is not being protected. Yes. And we, 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 we don't even call it sermons anymore. We call it talks, a series of talks, a series of lectures. Well, I'm sorry. This is not a Ted talk. I'm not Gary Vaynerchuk. I'm not Simon Sinek. I'm a man of God. I'm going to unapologetically teach you the scriptures. I'm not going to give you Mike Signorelli's opinion because it won't get you out of the parking lot, but I'm going to lay down the sword of the spirit and it will divide asunder even the soul from the spirit. And listen, man, at V1 Church, we got drag queens renouncing the lifestyle, surrendering their wigs and their makeup and pastors are like, how is it happening? And I'm like, I stopped giving them Enneagrams and I started giving them the gospel and the Ooh. word of God. I stopped giving them personality inventory so they can learn about themselves. Let me teach you about yourself. You're broken. You're jacked. You're traumatized. That's all you need to know about yourself. You're a sinner. That's what you need to know. But the, here's the gospel. You don't have to stay that way through Jesus Christ. And, and so for me, this whole new age thing, guys, Pagani and I live in the the epicenter of the new age culture. I mean, if new age had a capital, it'd be New York City. So if you're mm. like, why are these guys so passionate about this? Because <laughs> you got Daniel and Shadrach kicking it in New York City, Come on. <laughs> refusing to bow to this madness. So I don't know if that helped anybody. Let's no, move on. No, it's to the good. Next it's episode. good. I think I think people are excited tonight because so many people are like, finally, someone's willing to speak out against the trash yeah. that we're seeing in the church, and everyone's afraid to say anything. What if I say yeah. something and so and so says this about and thinks? If we're talking about witchcraft, if we're talking about the New Age movement, why are we allowing it to move into the church? Why would we not say something? I value the pulpit, the kingdom, the Bible more than I value people around me that are going to be mad that I'm saying this. Like, don't be mad that I'm saying this. Be mad that you're teaching the third eye. 
Don't be mad that I'm saying this. Be mad that you're in witchcraft, dominating people, controlling people, and using things that you're calling the Holy Spirit, which let's segue into some abuses in ministry that are happening right now, okay? Again, please, before you guys are seventh graders and you're like, oh, you must be thinking of so-and-so. No, we're not thinking of so-and-so. We are calling things out as, the, as they come and areas that we see are wrong. We're not petty enough to be thinking of a Zach certain person that's in the chat right now that we're trying to correct in front of almost 10,000 people. Do you really think we went live in front of almost 10,000 people to correct one person in the chat? Come on, guys. Let's just get, let's all grow up in God and realize that these are unhealthy practices. I saw a video this last week of somebody saying that they have a remote control anointing, a remote control anointing, and they were controlling people's body with their hand as they were praying. Guys, unapologetically, this is textbook grade A filet mignon witchcraft. This is high grade, high class witchcraft that's happening in Christian pulpits, at altars, and my mind is blown that hundreds of thousands of people watch this and don't say anything about it. My mind is blown that you can say, anyone that says, I have a remote control anointing is functioning in witchcraft. To control yeah. somebody's body with the Holy Spirit is vile, is sensual, and demonic. Especially when you have a female on the ground shaking her you know what in the air and wearing tight clothing and you're doing this over her shaking your hand controlling her body in a very very sexual manner i no no punches pulled no holding back this is demonic it must be called out and this is happening and it's also i'm i'm just going there and you guys can try to reel me in but i'm but good luck it's also okay. seep it's also seeping into our audiences it's also seeping into our communities. It's also seeping into our Discord uh, platforms and our Facebook pages and our YouTube communities. And our own people are starting to think that if I do this over someone's body like a puppet master, there's one person I know of that does this and controls bodies, and that's the devil. He's the ultimate puppet master that has invisible strings controlling people. A pastor, prophet, or apostle should not be shaking their hand controlling bodies and then publicly saying, now you said it publicly, so I'm calling you out publicly, and in the future, I may call, now you guys know my policy is like, I don't call it by name, I don't wanna cause, but I'm coming to a place, guys, where I'm getting so flustered and so sick to my stomach by this trash you guys may see me in the coming weeks call stuff out by name. I don't know. I'm praying about it right now. We're all praying what we should do about this. But I will say there's coming a point where I'm going to have to start blasting some of this stuff because this is not okay to control, manipulate people like this. Using the Holy Spirit, let me say it again, and a remote control anointing is a familiar spirit, a demonic spirit, an unclean spirit. There's nothing glorifying to God. And if you guys will give me some time after we talk a bit, I want to give a few quick uh, tests of whether something's the spirit or a demonic spirit. I'm going to show you guys definitively in scripture, whether it's a demonic spirit or the Holy Spirit. But yeah. I will say, if you're doing this, like a puppet controlling people and saying, I have a remote control anointing, watch this, and then kicking your foot and someone falls over, that's a demonic spirit, friends. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know how else to say it. It's not New Testament. It's not biblical. It's anti-biblical. It's dominating. It's controlling. And it's witchcraft. Um, another, big, another big one, and I'll toss it, a big pet peeve of mine, is watching people push pushing you guys know i hate pushing i hate hitting i've been pushed before i've had family members that will never go back to church because they were pushed i've had friends that will never go back to church because they were pushed when we're ministering to people we could lay hands and we should lay hands lightly if somebody's neck is going back you're pushing them you don't need to hit this is a spiritual war not a physical war. So we need to be careful as ministers that we're not pushing people. The Holy Spirit does not need our help. Praise the Lord. The war is never physical. Well, God told me to hit them. No, he didn't. Stop lying on God. It's not a physical war. It's a spiritual war. God does not need you to hit somebody. Did Was Jesus going around pushing people down and hitting them? No. He wasn't hitting them and he wasn't pushing them. That's actually called assault and you can get arrested for it. Literally, if you if you call some call the cops while you're at a service and you're being hit, you could get arrested for assault. You're not allowed legally to hit somebody. Like guys, I thought we knew this or push somebody down. If you go to the street right now to the corner and you grab someone's head and start pushing them down and you're right there by 7-Eleven and you hit them whatever and they press charges, you can go to jail for assault, friend. I'm telling you this. So why is it okay that pastors do this to people? Why is it okay that leaders are doing this to people, guys? And if you're doing it ignorantly, then just repent. 
Say, God, forgive me. I, I didn't mean to. I got zealous. And I'm, not, I'm not trying to throw you in the fires of hell. I'm just saying, guys, we need to be careful because it's abusive and people are never coming back to church. Imagine you bring your daughter you've been praying for. And I, I guys, I've watched this happen in real time. Yeah, you've been praying on. for six years, Pastor Mike, for your daughter. She finally comes to church and a man of God comes up to her and pushes her down. Five years of prayer out the drain, down the drain, and your daughter goes, this is why I'll never come back. I told you this was fake. I told you this was not real. Guys, I've watched this happen in real time. We, ha we can't do this. Well, it's a demon manifesting. I still wouldn't hit a demon. Where in the Bible does it say to hit a demon? If it is a demon manifesting, we still, and you guys can see I'm very passionate about this because I've been pushed many times and it's sickening yeah. to me. It makes my stomach turn. But really, guys, we have to handle the people of God. These are sheep. These are God's beautiful children. These, these people have come to us broken and hurting on, on their last leg, on their last penny, and we're over here abusing them, which leads come me on, into my yeah. next point. Let me just unload and you guys take over here. Come my come next on. point, people of God, help me, Lord, say this with wisdom, are coming vulnerable. They're coming with no money. I've been saying, and I'm not trying to virtue signal and be self-righteous, but when I do events at my church, I say, if you can't afford gas, I will personally pay for your gas. I've done this for like the last seven months. And people come to me and say, I paid $40 in gas. I literally have no money in my account, Isaiah. And I Venmo them gas money. I have no problem doing that because I want them at the service. So I'm saying, hey, if you come, I'll pay for your gas. They're coming with no money, guys, no money. And then we're at the altar where the man of God prophesying I hear the Lord saying, you need to sow $1,000 if you want your breakthrough. Think about how demonic this is. You are literally gatekeeping. You are creating a pay to win strategy, locking a blessing behind $1,000, locking a blessing, seeing a vulnerable lady praying for her drug addicted son. And you're saying, you need to give $1,000 if you're, you want your son delivered. And this lady goes, I don't have rent. I don't have money. I can't even pay my light bill. And guys, we're, we're pastors. We talk to these people. Some of these traveling yeah. evangelists, they just get up and leave and we have to deal with the aftermath. We're leaders and pastors of local churches. We deal with these people and these people are broke. They have no money and they come to church to get spiritual life. And then these false prophets are saying, you need to, I see the Lord saying, so 5,000 right now into this ministry. Now, maybe there's an off chance where the Lord says, tell them to sow into that ministry over there and give them a word of encouragement or guidance. But you're going to tell me that you're going to say, you need, your, you need to give $1,000 to get your deliverance into my ministry. You, you need to give. And you guys, I, I don't mind if you guys disagree with this. I just have to say this. You give $1,000 right now for a prophetic word. And this person's now saying, man, I really want healing. I really want breakthrough. I've been praying for years. And a pulpit bandit is going to come and drive by, literally rob me. And then people, oh, man. Whew, help on. me, Holy Ghost. Come on. They're pulling out credit cards, Mike. I'm They're pulling out credit cards. They've grown up in poverty. And all they do is they charge everything on a credit card and they get a credit card out. I've watched this happen in real time and they get the offering envelope and they're filling out credit card information. Why are you giving on your credit card to these false prophets that are literally robbing you? These pulpit bandits. So, man, guys, I know, I know I'm passionate. I know I'm not being carnal, guys. I'm not being carnal. This is not scriptural. If, if you could find me a scripture... I would be like, okay, maybe, but there's no scripture. It's domination. It's what psychics and let me just, okay. One more minute here. Psychics Go. and mediums do this. They say, this curse is going to come upon you. And you guys know this because you came out of the new age. This curse will come upon you. If you don't give a thousand dollars, you need to keep witch doctors do this. You need to give me $500 or a curse is going to come. If you give me 500, then when you give them 500, you come back and they say, I need another 500. Cause the demon said that they're going to get your family member in a wreck mediums i talked to a lady fifty thousand dollars she gave to an astrologer because he mm -hmm. kept saying if you don't give another thousand your stars aren't going to line up if you don't give another five thousand jesus didn't charge for miracles freely you've been given freely give i have a very high standard on not charging for deliverance not charging on for prayer not charging for you know your breakthrough never will god say if you don't give a thousand dollars you're not going to get a breakthrough guys i'm just saying i'm just saying i know people are gonna get mad uh, I, message me. I'll delete it, please. Guys, we got to stop doing this. Is there any other? I know I went on a soapbox. I'm sorry, guys, if I changed the atmosphere there. Um, no, no. What other abuses are you guys seeing? Or do you want to tap in and, and, and say about what I just said? Tag me in. Okay, yeah. so what we're not saying is that it's wrong to give to ministries that bless your life. That's not what we're saying. Amen. 
we'd be hypocrites here to sit here and say that all of our ministries don't ask people to donate. What we are referring to is this Ponzi scheme yep. that's going on in the name of ministry where people wow. are paying for sonship. And not only for sonship, they're also now double tithing. So now they have to tithe uh, from their ministry to their man or woman of God, and then their church to the man or woman of God. And then without this, without the, that form of giving, that they're walking in some level of dishonor, that they're not, uh, mm. that they don't believe in the vision. Guys, this is nothing more than abuse. It is abuse, especially if you're being told to give. Here's another thing, let me just throw this in there. Why it gotta be a thousand dollars? Why can't it be a ten dollar seed? What, what was that? Why not a one dollar seed? Why it gotta be a thousand dollar seed? Because this is nothing more than a spiritual Ponzi scheme. Now we're not saying if the Lord impresses on your heart to give some man or woman of God a thousand dollar seed or a five thousand dollar seed, but you know what the Bible says about giving through compulsion. And I'm here to tell yeah. you tell you how this works so the man or woman of god has some kind of car note that they need to pay off or they're lacking on their mortgage they they are this is what they do they create an event let's have this kind of conference and then they go in there with the intention of telling their preacher friends to make sure you do this and raise up this amount or they themselves will ask for the money and they're calculating they're calculating mm -hmm got to pay a $3,000 car note for whatever reason. So let me get 10 people to give $1,000. Do you see how that works? This is nothing more than a spiritual Ponzi scheme for many and is posing off as instruction of the Lord, some kind of uh, uh, prophetic thing that God is saying, and it, God is not in it. God is not in Come it, and on. we're calling it. You know, preacher, you know you're lying. You are living lav lavishly off of God's people and you're making merchandise oh. of God. And I'm telling every one of you, if you're, don't let no preacher force you to give no thousand dollar seed or any kind of seed that's not on your heart, especially after no curse. You give as the Holy Spirit. Yes. Sit on your heart to give as God gives both the seed to the sower to be able to sow according to what's on their heart. So, so, so that's another abuse that we wanted to tackle tonight. So good, so good. And let, then, let me, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. No, 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 go, go, go. I just want to cut in on the financial thing real quick because people will tell you, they'll tell you back, but apostle, what about Elijah who asked the widow woman to give her last meal and then she was gonna die? You know, it's okay for us to activate people's faith by, by requiring of them to give us their last bit. My response to that is, homie, you're not the prophet Elijah. <laughs> <Come on. laughs> you're prophesying out of the wrong covenant once again. And I think that's what, what happens. People pervert, they distort, and there's a fine line between activating people's faith and activa activating people's foolishness. Mm. Here's the thing. Are your followers fools or are your followers operating in stewardship and faith? Because God's going to look at the quality of the disciples you're raising up and he's going to say, are they radically generous or are they just radically stupid and, and foolish? And so we've got to raise up wise stewards that are radically generous. The other thing I want to say about finances, because again, every false prophet uses scriptures to justify how they're manipulating people to give. Every false deliverance minister and false apostle and false pastor uses scriptures to justify. But here's the question. So, so prophet, listen to me. Apostle, listen to me. Pastor, listen to me. What do the people think they're paying for? Mm. Not, not how did you mean it? Not how you can do mental and you know, linguistic gymnastics to get yourself out of it. What do the people think they're doing? The people think that they're paying for something that Christ already paid for in full. That's how you're going to be judged. When you stand before God, it's not how good did you explain your way out of that? It's going to be what did the people think that they were doing? That's the measure by which you'll be judged. And so do we call people to radical faith and generosity? Absolutely. But as wise, wise builders, we have to say, are we making you stewards who are radically generous? Or are we, like you said, Isaiah, are we, are we asking you to unlock something that Christ already, the, the veil has he been rent, paid for it been open, and he's already paid in full. He's already so paid for it. Because I'd love to get to 
pushing people down. I've got, but Apostle, did you have some? Let me let me no. tag on. Let me tag on. It's this is the worst part about it. The same Go people that it. are saying so a thousand dollars are flexing their twenty thousand dollar outfits on social media. I'm sorry, but it's incredibly cringe to be wearing a thirty thousand dollar outfit, flexing, posting pictures of you thirty times while you're asking your followers to give a thousand more dollars. Like, if you have the money, praise the Lord. If you're blessed, praise the Lord. Be blessed and have your finances and build whatever you're building. But don't be telling me give a thousand or you won't get a breakthrough. And then the same night you told me that you're flexing with your thirty thousand dollar Gucci outfit. I'm just saying. I don't know if that's if Gucci even makes clothes, but whatever it is. It's like, it's like insult to injury. You're going to just salt the wound. It's incredibly cringe and it's completely wrong. Sowing a certain amount to get a certain blessing is not scriptural. And if you, and I love what you said, if you're going to use that analogy, then all you're asking for is a little bit of bread. And I've never heard anyone say, I just need a small piece of bread. If you're going to, you know, the Lord says, trust him with a small, a small piece of wonder bread. It's like, no, you're asking for way more than a small piece of bread. Talk to us a little bit about uh, like altar, pushing, hitting. And then yeah. one other thing I wanted to touch on is putting people also in hypnosis, hypnotizing them yeah. and telling them, I want you to think about this and visualize. Uh, it's a big no. Okay, it's a big no. That's I'm no, not going to go into it, but go ahead on alter, yeah, I alter get, stuff. I, I, yeah, I want to get there. First of all, I want to say this, and please, somebody needs to look me in my eyes while I'm saying this. If you are a man, stop putting your hand on women's stomachs while you're praying for them. This might have been the most important moment for somebody in this entire broadcast. There are boundaries that have to be maintained. And I'm seeing people do things while they're praying for people that are very unwise. Mm. And so we talked, we talked about pushing people down, but I'm saying you got to be very aware of how you're touching another person. And so here's the thing. Are you relying on that particular point of contact or are you relying on the Holy Spirit that is going to do that work Come through on. you? And so I'm telling you, I've been seeing a lot of videos going online and I'm watching men touch other women's stomachs. It's super weird and it needs to stop. And all the women in the chat can say, amen. Don't the touch my I daughter's was, stomach. Oh, yeah. I, and you know what I'm saying? And then you'll get up there and do a sermon where you talked about how like sexually perverse you were for years and years and then get down off the stage and lay your hand on women's stomachs for the next hour. It's like, oh. okay, bro. So here's the thing though, let's talk about being forceful. Let's talk about, uh, let's talk about Smith Wigglesworth punching cancer out of people. Listen, the result is not always an endorsement of the method. Good. I'm going to say that again, because somebody needs to quote me because I, we told you guys to get your notebooks out today. The result is not always an endorsement of the method. Just because it worked doesn't mean the method made it worked. It's possible that God actually graced the method even though it was the wrong method. And I need people to understand that. First of all, you're not Smith Wigglesworth. Second of all, God is not in the method. And that's something that people don't understand. Just because it worked, there could have been a grace on that. Here, let me give you some scriptures, okay? The fifth chapter of Galatians tells you the behaviors that are the result of the attribute and characteristic of God in his presence and his working in our lives. And so if you spend time with the Holy Spirit, the fruit of that will be joy, peace, patience, kindness. Here's another one, gentleness. Mm. This, is, this is the attributes of God. Is that the attribute of your prayer ministry? If I asked a mm. secular person, an unsafe person from an anthropological perspective, from a sociological perspective, who doesn't know anything about the things of God. Here's a list of behaviors. Love, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And then I just want you to watch what this person does on behalf of God. Do, do wow. these things align? Here, and The answer is no. Matter of fact, Isaiah, you talked about puppeteering. Isn't it interesting that the Holy Spirit gives you control over yourself, but then some of these false prophets are controlling other people. So what's the opposite of self-control? It's controlling other people. It's like, so when you encounter God, you get more control over yourself. And I think what we're seeing is people do not, first of all, they don't know the word. 
Second of all, they're not being ambassadors of the word. And when you compare the, 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 the fruits of the spirit with ministry that people are claiming is happening on behalf of the Holy Spirit, they're not in alignment. Mm -hmm. I want people to say, man, this was an atmosphere of gentleness. This was an atmosphere of patience. This was an atmosphere of love and peace and joy. I've even done mass deliverances where people are flailing around and screaming and vomiting and foaming at the mouth. And, and I've said, how was that? You know what they've said? I felt the overwhelming love and compassion of the Father in the midst of it. It's possible. It's possible. Now, does that mean that people won't um, have different types of, you know, physical actions and response? We see in Scripture, it says that the ministers were not even able to stand to minister as the glory of the Lord came down. I understand that, and, but I don't think that those two thoughts are in contradiction because mm -hmm. both of those um, environments give glory to God. The difference is when you are uh, coming out like a WWF wrestler, like it's the main event and you are manhandling people all over the place, who's getting the credit? Who's getting the glory? It's you. Matter of fact, guys, I'll be, able, I'll be honest with you. I believe there's a realm beyond the anointing where you function in the glory. And more and more and more, I, and you guys can see this in footage, I haven't necessarily even been touching people and just allowing the Holy Spirit to do the work because, again, I'm trying to operate in a level of wisdom. Just because I can do it doesn't mean I should. And just because God did give me a, a result doesn't mean that he was in the method understand. Okay, listen, people are getting saved by a gospel presentation given by someone who may not even be saved. People are like, I served under that pastor. There's documentaries about him. He fell. That pastor was cheating on his wife, but I got saved. Was my salvation real? Yes, because God's will was done through a dirty vessel. It, it, that guy was wrong, but God, it wasn't an endorsement on that guy that you got saved. It was an endorsement on the gospel. And mm. so here's the thing, just because you're going around punching people, hitting people, puppeteering people, even if they claim that something good happened as a result of it, it's not an endorsement of your method. And I would challenge every single one of you, go to Galatians chapter five and start comparing your ministry and your methods of ministry to the fruits of the spirit. And that should be the litmus test. Wow. So good. And, and also remember, you're praying for someone's wife. Like, don't be touching my wife. I'm telling you right now, if you want to see uh, something come out of me, don't be touching my wife. Don't be touching <laughs> my daughters. Um, these are these are real people. These are not numbers for our viewer yeah. for views. These are not numbers for a TikTok video. These are not these are not just random no face people that are coming to our events. These are someone's wife, someone's daughter. And there's there's a lot of guys that I'm like, man, I wouldn't want him praying for my daughter. Like, why am I, yeah. why would I minister with someone that I don't want praying for my daughter or praying for my wife? And so we need to be very careful how we handle people, how we handle someone's wife. Hey, listen, some of y'all out here, you might get side busted one of these days. You're over there ministering to someone's wife and you just get knocked out from the side. I don't even know what to tell you. I can't jump in that fight because you're putting your hands in places it doesn't belong. It doesn't belong. You know, it's like, man, even on the back. That's where the bra strap is. I'm just saying, I wouldn't put my hand just right yeah. on a woman's bra strap. It's just not appropriate. I would just do lightly maybe on the shoulder if she has, you know, she's not wearing like a spaghetti strap or a low cut shirt or your hand on the top of her head is always safe, but sometimes you don't want to mess up the hair, but you just need to use wisdom. But I, like we said though, touching the stomach is a, is a sexual place and touching the back on the bra strap. There's just a lot of weird stuff that goes on a lot of weird stuff. If you look at some of these prophetic services, we could also just say what it is. 80% of them are young women. 80% yeah. of them are young women at some of these prophetic services. And then you have guys just doing some weird stuff. So there's a lot of sus stuff happening. We need to be careful on. Pagani, you want to jump in at all with the abuse from praying for people? No, I think you guys covered it. I think we still have more ground to cover. So I say let's just jump into the next one, which is discerning manifestations how to discern when it is demonic versus when it is godly. Go ahead, Isaiah. Mm, yeah, so one thing I want to say, because I know a lot of you say, well, how do I know if it's the Holy Spirit or know if it's a demon when someone's maybe laughing or speaking out or shaking uncontrollably? Because remember, the devil also mimics what God is doing. So there are times where it's hard to tell whether it's God or the Holy Spirit. And this goes for prophetic words. This goes for shaking, laughter, any manifestation you can think of. 
These are the five mm. ways, and I'm going to go quick. I have a long version on the channel, but I'm going to go quickly. Five ways to test whether something is a demonic spirit or a godly spirit. Number one, does the manifestation lead to repentance? This is, it doesn't matter what teacher, what preacher. In the New Testament, Jesus required repentance even more than faith. Jesus was constantly calling people to repent. In fact, in Mark 1 15, the first recorded word Jesus preached was repent. This was Jesus's first sermon in Luke 13. He says, unless you repent, you will likewise perish. In Acts 2 38, what did Peter preach? You must repent. What does the book of Acts say? For a time, God overlooked ignorance, but now God requires all men everywhere to repent. So repentance mm -hmm. is a foundational doctrine found in Hebrews chapter six. We need to repent. The message we should be preaching is out of repentance. If the manifestation is not leading people to a place where they're repenting of their sin, like, I don't care if you fall over, I care that you repent and change your lifestyle. A lot of you fall over a drunkard and get up a drunkard. A lot of you fall over perverted and get up perverted. A lot of you fall over cussing and get up cussing. Our goal is not to get you to fall over, and if you do fall over, praise the Lord. Our goal is that you'd be changed. Repentance brings life change. So number one, repentance must happen. Number two, does the sign and wonder or manifestation lead to a love for scripture? Do mm. you come out of the manifestations loving scripture more or loving scripture less? Jesus calls the Bible the word of God. And in John 10, 35, it can, says it cannot be broken. So these signs and wonders need to lead, leave you with a love for scripture. You should be leaving hungry for scripture. Isaiah 66, two, the one who I esteem. So who does God esteem? Look at this. The man that is humble, there, there's already just qualifying a bunch of us, contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. There should be an honor reverence for God's word, for the scripture. John 14, 23, Jesus said, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and he'll come and make my home in each of them. So doing the words of Jesus, doing what Jesus says, a love for God's word, Jesus's words. John 12, 48 says, we will be judged by the word of God. So guys, if the manifestation is leading you away from reading the Bible, leading you towards the person's teachings that are not biblical, there's danger. Number three, does the manifestation, I love this, glorify Jesus or does it glorify the person? In other words, mm -hmm. is the prophecy, the words of knowledge, the amazing signs and wonders, are they bringing glory to the prophet, apostle, or pastor, or evangelist doing them, or does the glory go to Jesus? Is the attention going to Christ? Are you laughing in the middle of a sermon? If you are, and you're saying, this is the Holy Ghost making me laugh, you're taking attention off of the word, which is bringing glory to Jesus, and you're putting it on yourself. John 16, 13, when the spirit comes, he will draw you into truth. Look at this and will glorify me. So the Holy mm. Spirit, Jesus says his job is to bring glory to Jesus is to glorify. Number one job of the Holy Ghost, glorify Jesus. Stop telling me that that's a spiritual manifestation. That's not bringing glory to Jesus. I look at some of these people's TikToks and every video, there's only bringing glory to them only false manifestations, no glory to Jesus. It's not God, stop lying. Number four, does it produce a love for me for other Christians? John 13, 35, Jesus said, by this you'll know you are my disciples if you're, for your love for one another. The apostle Paul said in 1 Timothy 1, 5, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and sincere faith. So if these manifestations is causing me to not love other believers and come in unity in the church, it's probably not God. And there's a lot of more on love. First Corinthians 13, two and more. Okay. Last one. Number five, after this manifestation, am I now more concerned with the lost? Is there, is it bringing a concern for the lost people to share the good news, to preach the gospel? Our goal is to win the lost. Second Corinthians chapter five, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation as if God was speaking through us, calling people back to him. All of these manifestations are great, praise the Lord, but if they're not bringing glory to Jesus, if they're not giving you a love for scripture, if they're not leading you into deep repentance and holiness, if you're not concerned with reaching the lost after, then it's safe to say these are false manifestations. If they're exalting the person, glorifying a person, then it's safe to say these are not, and I'm giving you guys scripture, this is not my opinion, these are not bringing glory to God. Is there any other telltale signs of something you guys want to jump in and say this is not bringing, this is a false manifestation? I do want to jump in and say this, that just because the, the person with the microphone says Jesus doesn't mean 
they're glorifying Jesus. Go ahead. <laughs> I think R is to be set to the biblical Jesus. Yes. The said, just because someone is saying Jesus, Galatians chapter 1, they could be actually giving you another Jesus which you have not known. And I hear this all the time because they'll say, well, this person glorifies Jesus. As a matter of fact, they say Jesus all the time. They, they you know, they, they're talking about Jesus. So they couldn't possibly be of the devil because they keep saying Jesus. The question is not that they're saying Jesus is which Jesus are they referring mm. to? The Bible talks about that there are many Jesuses. Galatians chapter one says there are many Jesuses out of the world. And then it also, also this, watch this. Galatians actually also, chapter one says that there are many different spirits out there. So just because they say the spirit is telling me doesn't mean that it's really the Holy Spirit that's telling him. Which Holy Spirit, which spirit is actually telling them why? Because Galatians chapter one says, if you received a different spirit than that which we preach. So guys, don't get caught up with etymology and word semantics. Your bar for discernment cannot be the aesthetics of a church service. We know what to say. I'm a pastor. I've been a pastor for 19 years. All of us have been pastors here. There's a certain way to do church. Mm. It's actually called a form of godliness. What does that actually mean? That word form of godliness. It means the formula of godliness, which means we know how to sing the two fast, slow songs, uh, slow song, collect the, collect the, the uh, you know, the, the offering, all of that. So just because someone goes up there and says, you know, we thank God to Jesus. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the Jesus of the Bible. And your discernment shouldn't be walking away saying, wow, I think I'm going to come back. I like this ministry. They could possibly be uh, a warlock because they mentioned Jesus. Warlocks can mention Jesus, man. False mm. prophets mention Jesus. Uh, false apostles can mention the Holy Ghost. Your bar has to be centered in the scriptures to understand which Jesus are they portraying and the Holy Spirit will actually show you. Is this the true biblical sound doctrine, the, the, uh, the author, Christian Orthodox Jesus, or is this this new guru version of Jesus that leaves you in your sin, makes you a prophecy mm. like a crackhead, makes you a deliverance junkie? Oh, come on. I'm Go ahead. Upgrade your standard of discernment and move beyond the form of man, Mike. I see you move and talk to me. I'm What's just turning up. <laughs> Keep going. You know, so that's what we wanted to say is that can be also another way to help upgrade our discernment. Go ahead, Isaiah. Yeah, I want to well, also go ahead. Go ahead, Mike. <laughs> I just have to. I have to. I'm feeling the fire because this this broadcast is different. I don't know if you guys in the chat can say something. Let me talk to me. But let me just say this. Three people cough. One has cancer, one has COVID, and one has a cold. Mm. It's the same symptom. It's a different route. Okay? Two people in a church service are laughing hysterically. One person is receiving an impartation from the Holy Spirit, and the other person, it's a demon laughing. Two people are shaking uncontrollably. One person is receiving a breakthrough in the spiritual realm and the Holy Spirit's doing something. The other person, it's a demon manifesting. But you won't know if you know the voice of your favorite YouTuber or TikToker more than the voice of the, of the Holy Spirit. Wow. You won't know if you can tell me what their voice sounds like, but you don't know scripture. You don't know the voice of the Father. And the problem is people are scrolling on their phones and spending more intimate time with these prophets and these men and women of God than they are God. And, yes. and, and that's the difference. That's the difference. And so how do you know what's real and fake? Spend enough time with the real because the fakes are going to multiply. There's millions of versions of fake. There's a multiverse of fake. But if you know what the real is, I thank God that when I first received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the gift of tongues, when I was first journeying with the Lord, I would spend four, five, six hours a day in prayer. I thank God that the first ministry that my pastor let me do at the local church was leading the intercessory group Come on. and not being up on the stage, being in the pulpit. That's my roots. 
That's my foundation. And I feel something stirring in me. You have forsaken the secret place. I don't know who this is for. You have forsaken intimacy with the Father and you're trying to replace it with a 59 second dope dopamine dosage from your favorite preacher, whatever. The only reason why these false prophets and these false apostles and men of God are thriving is because they are a drug dealer for a drug called dopamine in your brain, but we are not to operate out of our soulish realm. We are not to operate out of our flesh. We are to operate out of our spirit. And some of you guys, and I've been saying this over and over again, I was at a revival in North Carolina and I did a moment where Gen Z came up and, and sacrificially gave their phone. That one clip got over 4.1 million views in 24 hours wow. when that ministry posted it because the world is starting to recognize you know, we, I think we spent most of this, uh, this time targeting false prophets, false p apostles. I want to target the people who are platforming them right now, mm. because that's really what needs to happen. If you'll go to the secret place, these people, you, you won't watch their stuff anymore. If you'll go to the secret place, have an encounter with God, get intimate. If you'll learn how to push your plate aside and fast and get into the word, you won't platform them anymore. They won't have an audience anymore. And then what might happen when, they, when their finances dwindle because you stop being pimped and prostituted by their ways of getting money, when their monetization decreases, they might actually repent and say, man, I might have to learn how to do it the right way. Come on. <laughs> So, so I don't know who that was for, but we've got to be a people of his presence. We've got to bring the ark back to the city. We've got to be the kind of people that know how to pray because when we become that kind of people, we create environments that they suffocate for the lack of oxygen in that environment. They're like, man, I'm not getting any attention Come on. because these people already have the eyes of their heavenly father on them. Ain't nobody going to try to open a third eye when the eyes of the heavenly father are upon us. And there's something about that secret place. And this answer is too simple. I'm not charging you $999 for what I just told you. It's too simple. And, and the, the new age is thriving off of Christians that want to complicate it. I mm. think this needs to be said as well, because I'm on a roll right now. Just cut my stream. Okay. Cut no, my feet. But let me just tell you, as you become more mature in the things of God, as you become more advanced in the things of the spirit, you will become more simple. That My is what man. I see over and over again. Guess what? You want to know what the what the advanced class is? I pray more. I fast more. I read the word more. I give more. I'm more generous. I become more simple as I become more advanced. That is the way of the kingdom. And the new age is thriving because you all want to be 16, 34, 27. Tell me this. Oh, the, you want to be so esoteric. You've become a magi, not a man of God. Mm, preach you guys are hitting so, them strong i don't i sorry i'm sorry no, I've i only pray you know my my in, prayer in is some years. of my prayer is some of the guys teaching this would really question what they're teaching would really publicly repent and say i was wrong about this and there's hope for everyone there's hope for the guys even teaching and controlling people the remote control and doing all this demonic new age garbage there's hope for them to repent to turn from their ways, to humble themselves before God, and to get back on the straight path. We don't want no one to go to hell. We don't want no one right. to go to hell, but we also are forced to be reckoned with and need to push back. Maybe this, maybe the fact that there's 10,000 of you here and we're preaching this will startle some false teachers to go, maybe I should be careful on saying certain things, or maybe I should not do certain practices. Maybe I should stop controlling people with the Holy Spirit and teaching on opening your third eye. So I'm praying our goal is that repentance would come. Our goal is as we give this prophetic warning to the body of Christ, you know, we're two hours in, this has been, this has been really a masterclass on deception, on exposing deception. I pray the that they would go, Hmm, maybe I'm go the, ahead. Chat room, the chat rooms are packed. No one has left. It's been strong. Yep. It means that there is a need Isaiah for us to keep going yep. in yeah. this a topic because we've already maximized the time that we normally have for uh demon slayers podcast but i let's just keep going because and, and we're going to pray we're going to pray mass deliverance here soon because if some of you are like i'm in this bondage now i'm not saying so and so gave you a demon but i am saying if you open yourself up to these teachings you are open you don't need them to give you a demon you're opening yourself up to a demon when you come under these practices and guys let's just say i want to also touch on this 
Prophecy is a very personal thing. When somebody's prophesying over you, you're opening your spirit up to them. You're literally saying, you can speak into me. You can speak in my spirit. Now, this is similar to what mediums do. Mediums need to get you to open yourself up and agree mm. to them giving you a word. So it's scary when you watch some of these services where these, these teachers are getting people to open themselves up and then proceeding to give them false words and performing, next topic, prophetic witchcraft. What is prophetic wow. witchcraft? Prophetic witchcraft is when you use prophecy to dominate, manipulate, control, and govern decisions of people's lives. When you start, now let's just say it here, when they start telling you, your husband's not a man of God, you should have never married him, you're not really married in the eyes of God, you need to leave that man and find someone in the church, that is prophetic witchcraft. God did not tell you no grounds for it, no grounds in scripture, but you're telling me a prophet told you to leave your husband and now you need to be a part of his thing and be, uh, and then he gives you his number so he can invite you to the prayer thing. Come on guys, that is witchcraft. It's him using the word of God. Well, God told me, no, he didn't. A familiar spirit, the devil told you. Don't say God told me to tell someone. I have had people come to me, Pagani, that say, a prophet gave me a word that I was to leave my husband. And I, I asked them this, did your husband cheat on you? No. Did your husband abandon you? No. Is your husband dead? No. Those are the only three grounds for biblical divorce. If your husband dies, if your husband commits sexual immorality, cheats on you, or if your husband abandons you, literally leaves you and is nowhere to be found because of your faith. The only three things in scripture you can get a divorce. Don't tell me some prophetic witchcraft prophet told you to leave your husband. Prophesying babies, marriages, all these things we that these prophets use to manipulate people if if we're using prophecy to manipulate now i also want to ask you guys this okay what is your thoughts on because i'm seeing this is very popular right now these prophets that are saying michael the angel gabriel the angel and let's just be honest these are archangels that have much busier things to do than come give you a prophetic word about aunt sally stop lying gabriel and michael did not come down and give you a prophetic word okay michael and gabriel can only be at one place at one time they're on the, they're not omnipotent they're not omnipresent they did not show up to your church with 100 people in it and give you a word for that lady what is your guys's thoughts on these prophets that are saying an angel just whispered this and everything is an angel i i i'm just saying for me i could be wrong i could be wrong i would be leery on non-stop getting words from angels especially when they don't match scripture why are no. you constantly hearing from an angel when you have the holy spirit if the if you're if you're flowing in prophecy do we see that in the new covenant of angels constantly giving words i mean what are your guys' thoughts on this whole phenomenon of an angel or an, a saint or an old family member who's a cloud of witness came and get i mean what are your guys' thoughts on this stuff well first and foremost an angel doesn't substitute the paracletos mm. and the which is the Holy Spirit. As a matter of fact, Jesus said, I go away to send you another comforter. He didn't say, I go away to send you an angel of the Lord. Let that sink in right there. Um, second, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 specifically says this. And you don't have to agree with me, but I'm going to stick to sola scriptura. Look what it says concerning these cloud of witnesses of either Old Testament saints or New Testament saints coming and relaying all of these messages. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 and 2 says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, Come on. He has spoken to us only by His Son, whom He has appointed heir of all things, through whom He made the universe. So, so in, in the previous dispensation, yes, we find God doing some pretty miraculous supernatural occurrences. In the new dispensation, he does still pretty miraculous things, but instead of using many of the saints and the prophets in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, he's only using one, Jesus Christ. Mm. And the person of the Holy Spirit through Jesus. Did mm. you catch what I just said? That's what the Bible says. So you could take it for whatever you want. Yeah. All of these visitations of major or minor prophets or King David came to me is not scriptural. Come it on. is a Hebrews chapter one. We're calling it out, 
Second, I'm going to talk to you like New York. You lying. You're making yourself appear bigger than everyone else. You're, you're causing yourself to elevate yourself over the rest of the people because ain't none of the rest of us ain't talked to Michael lately. Has Michael talking to you lately, Isaiah? Come on. Come on. No. Has Gabriel talked to you lately, uh, Mike? No. So then all, so all of a sudden, Gabriel talking to you and Michael talking to you. What does that do to you? It elevates you above everyone else. And that is diametrically opposed to what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 concerning how God tempers the body so that none is above the other. Just own it for what it is. You are lying. You are lying. That is not God doing that. Or I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. You are deceived. Mm. And maybe you did have a vision and you just have a reprobate mind and really don't know that that's not coming from God. And another thing, let me also say, do not try to use the witch of Endor to say, well, Samuel came up and uh, spoke through, uh, spoke to King Saul. So obviously God can you. First of all, two things happened there. One, it's a witch of Endor. Go ahead. Which means which means Samuel had to go in the witch to be able to communicate. So a human spirit went inside another human spirit, not in the Bible. That is not biblical. Second, Samuel said to Saul, you're going to be coming down here with us. Samuel's not down there. Samuel is up there. Did you catch what I just said? So all of this stuff is what I would call descriptive. These are events that happen in scripture, but now they're being twisted in this modern apostolic and prophetic move. And they're taking descriptive, biblical, historical events, and they're making them prescriptive. And that's when you get into error, because I'm here to tell you, baby, I'm sorry. That ain't King David talking to you. That is not Moses talking to you. That is not, that is a familiar yes. spirit appearing yeah, that's it this and i want you to own it and we're calling it out and don't believe none of these vagabond charlatans preaching this foolishness because it's not found in the bible and but we're also what we're not saying is we're not saying that people can't have an experience where god is speaking to you because people have visions and dreams in the old testament what we are saying is this listen to me listen to me listen to me let me go a little closer if, if, if Ezekiel is coming to you, that's necromancy. Yep. And necromancy is a sin. It is a sin. 100%. I'm going to leave it there. So good. Forbidden. Forbidden. And here's the thing. Just because these prophets are accurate, when they say that an angel that. told them, and I, it needs to be said, because that's what's going to happen, Apostle, is... Is, is the they're going to say, the false prophet's going to say, an angel just told me to say this, and it's going to be so incredibly accurate. It's going to be your phone number. It's going to be your address. It's going to be your brother's name. It's going to be a situation in your life. And you're like, well, but it has to be true because it's accurate. And this is where the deception happens. Listen, access to information is not the same as authority for that information. By whose authority is that information being distributed? The other thing that needs to be said is if you're getting words from an angel, then an angel gets the credit. Mm. But if you're getting words from the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gets the credit. Angels show up in the New Testament to herald a designation of time, a transition of a season, and major fulfillment of prophecy. The Bible does talk about us entertaining angels unaware, new covenant. I've had what I believe are angelic encounters. Yep, I've taught too. about, about about him on my YouTube channel. I had a significant angelic encounter in the process of planting my church here in New York City that I've told from the stage many, many times. But again, when you talk about the realm of prophecy and angels now are get, listen, the only Michael you're hearing from is the one talking through this microphone right now. Come I can on. tell you that right now. Because some of you guys, it's, and here's the thing, how, how, think about this. God is referred to as a jealous God. Yes. Can you imagine that Jesus with outstretched arms dies on the cross to come into fellowship with you and then you're going to be foolish enough to try to talk to an angel? What level of disrespect? This is, you know, I know uh, Pagani rolled out the $100 words on you and gave you the theological doctrinal. I'm just talking to you straight up right now. Can you imagine the heart of Christ? 
to see his people. They, they don't talk to him. They mindlessly scroll on their phone. And then when they do open their mouth to talk to a spirit, it's an angel. Mm. <laughs> Can you imagine? It's like we have it, we have misaligned our priorities. We need to bring our priorities back in alignment. And but here's the thing, and I've been waiting the whole broadcast to say it. And this is why this is such a necessary teaching. Whatever leaders do in 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 just a little dosage, their followers were due in a larger measure. Whatever, whatever I do, because what happens is when people see that it works, and I'm saying this in air quotes. When people see that it gets results, they will do it in, in, in extreme. And so what happens is sometimes they talk about getting a word from an angel or from a loved one that passed along, sometimes the Holy Spirit. Like you said, a form of godliness is always a mixture. And that's why people receive it. That's why the brownies look, they look like brownies. They smell like brownies, you know, and that's how you slip the poison into the drink is you, it's undetectable. You, it's just a mixture. And that's what we're trying to help you guys detect and understand in this is it's not exclusively getting words from angels, exclusively getting words from uh, loved ones that pass away. It's going to be a mixture of all the, the above. And that's the cyanide. That's the poison that's in the drink that these Come prophets on. are serving you. We're helping you discern it yeah and people were, i love what you said because you said people think that the accuracy validates the source when it does it which is warlocks mediums are accurate people say yeah well if the prophet's not of god like you're saying then how is it they knew that i was at that party last week because the demon they're listening to was at the party with you it's called a familiar <laughs> spirit they're like i don't know how he knew i'm like i know how he knew the demon was there the demon's familiar with you and so if a, if a a, I was going to say man of God, but if a false prophet says, I saw you doing this in your bedroom, blah, 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 and starts saying, which by the way, some of this stuff is just weird. Like, uh, I don't even go into that. I'll go to that after. But they say this weird word, and then you're like, how would they have known that? Because the angel, it is an angel. Okay. We need, we do need to correct ourselves. It is an angel. It's a fallen angel. Okay. So they are, wow. they are hearing from an angel, but it's a fallen angel, a demonic angel that's using that word to validate them while continuing to perpetuate a gospel that's false. So the angel is telling them something, and he is probably named Michael, but not Michael the one that's in heaven, Michael the one that's a real a real, a real angel, a real spirit. So we need wow. to be careful and discern that there's dark angels, there's dark evangelists, there's dark apostles, there's dark prophets that are out here stunting on people, flexing on everybody, yeah. giving these words. Let me Let me just say one more, and I'm just gonna be straight with this. And again, I pray there's repentance. I pray people yeah. would publicly all that. Cause of course the guys, some Good. of the guys we're talking about are watching this right now. They're in, they're here right now watching. If you, and this, I just saw this again, all within the last few weeks. Cause I've been doing my research on this stuff before we get on here and blast this. If you lay your hand on somebody and say, go to sleep and you put them to sleep by definition, that is called hypnosis. That does not belong in the church. It belongs at the county fair. If you're putting people to sleep at the altar, and I just saw a guy do this literally this week, and I'm, praise the Lord, I'm not saying names. I'm biting my tongue because of things. But if it continues, I have no choice, and I'm not making a threat. I'm making a promise. We can't allow this to be happening in the church and just sit idly by. If you're laying your hands on someone and saying, go to sleep in Jesus' name, and they fall asleep, and then you laugh about it and say, oh, I'm using spiritual NyQuil on them. Friend, that's demonic. I'm telling you right now, it's witchcraft, it's demonic. And if you didn't do it, I wouldn't be calling it out, but it's wrong. It's not secondary. It's not, oh, you believe in pre-trib, I believe in post-trib. It's not, oh, you believe on Saturday we worship Sunday. It's called hypnosis. It happens at the county fair. It's part of the new age. It's all part of what we're talking about tonight. It's complete and utter witchcraft. Do not defend it. Do not try to jump in front and say, oh, well, they just meant, you didn't mean anything. We don't need to talk about it. You just need to repent from that because this is mind control. It's new age. It's demons. And you can't be telling me, oh, well, well they're casting out demons. Really prove it. If you're saying they're casting out devils, friend, just because someone's saying come out and they're falling on the ground shaking doesn't mean the demon's coming out. So don't be Same. deceived. Some of these guys that are saying they're casting out devils are not casting out demons. All they're doing is just irritating and tickling the demon and the person laughs and rolls around and shakes and that's all. And, and again, I don't want to be the guy. I don't want to say this, but somebody has to say it because it's happening. If this wasn't happening in the church, 
whatever, they're doing it. I'm not gonna call the yoga people out there. The I'm not gonna make a whole video about a yoga teacher on YouTube. She's, she's lost. We don't judge the world, Paul says. But I already gave you scripture earlier. In the church? Oh, you're gonna come up in the body of Christ? whom Christ died for up in the church and start putting people to sleep at the altar and start using your witchcraft and familiar spirits? Not today, not when we have a voice, not when we have a platform, not when there's 10,000 people right now here listening saying, amen, don't play with God, stop, stop. And, and, and if these people continue to do this, don't get mad at me that you got caught in the crossfire because we're going at it. We're not playing, guys, we're not playing. We're in the last days, deception's real, um, yeah. There's, there's my on the putting people to sleep. It's demonic and witchcraft. Okay, let me, let me say this for those of you in the chat room saying I'm confused. Stop it. You are not confused. Thank you. I was just not confused. The problem is, is, is that you're being rattled in your cage because yep. your favorite idol is being confronted and now your idolatrous uh, self is being challenged. Don't give me that. I'm confused. Uh, so you're saying the angels can't talk to humans? You know that's not what we're saying. Stop that. That's that goofy little kid foolishness, evangelical baby Christian stuff that keeping you bound. You know that's not what we're saying. You know what we are addressing. Why? Because the Spirit is giving testimony about what we mean, even though we're not saying names, and even though we're being very generic. You can't sit here and say you're confused. You're not confused. You know exactly what's happening. The second thing that I want to say is this. For those of you that are saying, well, did Jesus uh, uh, commit necromancy because Moses and Elijah spoke to him? This, come here, come here. <laughs> it was Jesus. It was not you. You are not Jesus, false apostle. You are not Jesus, controlling bishop. You are not Jesus, Jezebel prophetess. You are not Jesus. They were talking to Jesus. Mm. Second, watch this. When Peter tried to talk to them, the Shekinah showed up and blocked them out and said, this is my son. That's oh, it. Talk to him. Hebrews chapter one. So anybody that's saying, oh, I was just talking with Moses. Oh, I met with Michael. I'm here to tell you, Michael's in Israel. Go Michael's all the way, the archangel is in Israel, watching Israel, that's his job. He is not in your city. He is not visiting your church. He is not visiting your ministry. He is in Israel, guarding over the nation of Israel. So you know what we mean, stop it. And I'm here to tell you, I'm with Isaiah. We've already, us three, made a decision that if this keeps up, we're going to collectively go at it. And it is what it is, but you don't have to. Last thing I want to say is this, before we get into some of the other stuff, is prophet, apostle, for some of you, we're not saying, some of, them are, some of you are false. There are others of you, you are true. You are true prophets. You are true apostles. I'm here to tell you, we're here to tell you, you have gone the way of Balaam. Come on. Yeah. The way of Cain. You are following the footsteps of Cain. And God is saying, return back to your first love, because if not, you're going to be given over to a reprobate mind and a seared conscience. And when you stand before God, both groups are going to have to give an account. And then you will be Lord, Lord. Did I not cast out demons in your name? Did I not prophesy in your name? Depart from me, because I never even knew you. I'm gonna leave it there. That's good. So good. There's a weight on that. There's a weight on that. I think people feel it in the chat right now. The question that I've been asking the entire night, are we protecting culture or the kingdom? Mm. Because there's a lot of things that happen that people say, well, wait a second, Isaiah, wait a second, Pagani, this is culture. This is how we do it where we live. This is how we do it in our denomination, in our stream, in our church. And the question that I keep asking myself, are we protecting culture or are we protecting the kingdom? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of what this comes down to tonight is we're trying to rightly divide scripture. I'm not going to be judged, but on the basis of what year were you alive? What country did you live in? Wow. I mean, when I first came out to New York City, people told me, oh, you're not from New York City. You're from Chicagoland. There's no way you'll be successful in New York City. I said, listen, homie, I didn't come here to learn New York City culture. I came here to change it. Mm. I came here to bring the culture of the kingdom. 
And so people are like, well, this is how we do it in my culture. Well, listen, when you get when you stand before God, you're not going to be judged on the basis of when did you live, where did you live. Wow. You're going to get judged on the basis of Jesus taught the disciples to pray, your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven, your will be done. And so what we're trying to do is say, just because you're watching it through the window of social media, just because you're getting a picture into some other culture or some other flavor of Christianity, listen, there are no denominations in heaven. There, 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 it's a monoculture. Heaven is a kingdom. And so what we are at is we're not trying to tell you this is how uh, Caucasian uh, evangelical America Americans do it. That, that is, I hope you didn't hear that we are trying to teach you this is how to be an American evangelical. We, I hope you didn't hear that. What we are trying to say is we are at, after the heart of God. We are trying to say kingdom come, examine our motives, examine our methods, examine us. We want to be a pure vessel and we want to make sure that when we get to heaven, we're getting a high five from Paul. We're getting a high five from Peter and they're saying, that was crazy what you did. You you, you never hid the, the cross under the flag of the United States. You were a believer first. Just like I'm not trying to export American Christianity, don't import Christianity from your context. Ooh. Let us all seek the kingdom together. Wow. And, the, and when that happens, these arguments disappear about, well, it's your way versus my way. No, it's his way. It's Yahweh. Come on, So somebody. good. And let me say this, and then Pagani, I'm going to toss it over to you and to do the last segment before we pray, um, because there's something I want him to share before we get into the mass deliverance prayer, yep. which we're going to do mass deliverance. I'm going to, I'm going to end my segment with how I started. Do not get into factions. We are not creating factions. We're not creating cliques. We already told you guys that Vlad is on vacation. It's why he's not here. We already told you guys that we have Demon Slayer podcast with Daniel, with Greg, with all the different, we had nine people on, we had 10 people on, we had five people, six people, it varies. Okay, we started this podcast two years ago with us four guys. Do not get in factions saying, I'm of Isaiah, I'm of Mike, I'm of Daniel, I'm of Pagani, I'm of Greg, I'm of Vlad. Don't, don't do factions, none of us want that. That's not beneficial. Paul said it's literally carnal. Paul said, if you do that, I mean, just warn you guys, if you start factioning up, you are carnal and you're not you're not doing what we're telling you to do tonight scripturally in this video our goal tonight was not to create factions was not to create groups we're all friends we're all doing events together is not to create a clique our goal is to bring biblical correction to witchcraft practices that are happening in the church they're trying to marry mysticism and hinduism and buddhism with christianity and all we're saying is not today satan so don't get mad at us we're coming against spirit. Our battle, Ephesians 6. Let me end and I'm going to pass it to Pagani for this last segment. Our battle, guys, is not flesh and blood. I am not fighting anyone physically tonight. I'm not fighting yeah. any person. I'm fighting demonic spirits, principalities, rulers of darkness, hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. We're fighting spirits and strongholds. And the Bible says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. And what do we do? We demolish every lofty argument, every fable, every fairy tale that's made up about this stuff that exalts itself above the knowledge of God. And we pull it down in Jesus' name. We come against, so don't get all mad. Oh, you're against so-and-so, stop. We're not in seventh grade anymore. Guys, I'm 31, I don't even have the energy or time, I'm too old to play factions and seventh grade, you can't eat with us. We're at this table, you have to go eat in the bathroom. Come on, dude, we're all grown adults. Let's attack doctrine, let's attack heresy, let's not allow witchcraft to come in the church because it's one thing, it's little, 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 and then here we are, everything's falling apart. So please guys, hear what I'm saying. Don't be immature. I'm glad Pagani yeah. said that. We're not saying you can't have encounters. We're not saying you can't give prophetic words. I literally taught for two hours last night on the how to give a prophetic word and the prophetic. All of us here are spirit filled. All of us here are charismatic. We believe in all the gifts. We all prophesy. We all give words of knowledge. We all cast out demons. We all believe in all the gifts. So don't come on here. You guys are being religious. Stop. You know that's not true. You know all of our content is on the Bible and the supernatural. We're trying to bring correction. Who's going to bring it if, charis if, if charismatics are not going to keep each other accountable? Then do we expect the reformed brethren to? Because I promise you, 
We're yeah. way nicer than they are about this stuff. We're people that actually practice prophecy. We actually practice laying hands on the sick. We actually practice casting out devils. So please don't start with, you guys are just being religious. The devil is a liar. Defending witchcraft is not freedom. It's bondage. Let me say it again. Defending witchcraft is not freedom. It's bondage. You're not not religious because you defend witchcraft, you're deceived. Uh, Pagani, what, ab what about after all of this? What, what, what would you think after all of this? Let's get the last segment and then we're gonna pray mass deliverance after that. I'm gonna ask that Pastor Mike, we'll kind of jump in towards the last one when we get into it, because he had a special interest in this. Okay, so let me just, let's, let's just establish what's going to happen. There is going to be a ripple effect after today. A video like today, of everything that we've confronted, there's going to be reactions to it. There's going to be counterattacks to it. There's going to be uh, counter responses to it. And here are some things that we have written here of what to look out for simply because at least for today, we blew the trumpet in Zion and now the gig is up. So if you think that these uh, uh, false individuals are just gonna like, oh, they, you know, I'm cool. They're not gonna, no, there's going to be a re-strategizing and you need to be privy of it. So we're gonna, I'm gonna give you about six, but I'm not gonna go deep into them. Number one, the first thing you're gonna see as the direct result in the next couple of days, in the next couple of weeks after this video, and then the, the when the trendiness uh, wears off, number one is what you're gonna see from these uh, individuals that we are referring to in this whole teaching is you're going to see them change their message going back to the simplicity of the gospel, but it's not going to be authentic. It's going to be a farce. So that way people don't get confused and say, oh, there they go again, teaching that new age stuff. So you're going to see that there's going to be a radical shift in the message according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. As I quote them, you guys can follow. Uh, your homework is to go look it up. So you're going to see them change their message. And you're going to see a lot after today, Christ-centered message, messages, gospel-centered messages. Uh, everything is going to be Jesus-centered and Jesus this and Jesus that. Why? Because now they have to divert uh, and counterattack what we said that their ministries divert everyone's attention to them. Now they're going to start diverting it away back to Jesus and it's not going to be real. It's going to be a method of change so that way people don't realize that this type of individual fits their description. Number two is 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 15. You're going to find them preaching holiness again as opposed to what they were preaching before. And again, it's not going to be real. So there's going to be a lot of emphasis of, of switching uh, their style in how uh, they administer stuff. Why? Because the text uh, here says that Satan's ministers transform themselves mm. to ministers of righteousness. So watch this. Every tactic that we were confronting today, watch them not do it for a long time because now they're going to be held accountable uh, to be those wow. individuals that are doing that. And that's nothing more than transforming themselves to servants of righteousness. You're going to find that their mannerisms are going to change in their preachings. You're going to find the way that they minister and the methods that they do. You're going to find that there's going to be a switch. It's not real. It's just a switch according to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse, uh, verse uh, 15. Number three is they're going to change their image. Wolves in sheep's clothing, when they're found out, all they do is change their sheep's clothing. You missed what I just said. So you're going to find that they're going to step away from the high standard of how they were living. And now they're going to lower themselves to be common like everyone else so that people could say, oh, you're just like us. But a month ago, you were acting like you were a celebrity superstar. You're going to find that the celebrity mannerisms are going to shift. And now what they're going to do is they're going to shift their sheep's clothing for another sheep's clothing. So that way they can begin to mingle with the people again and you're gonna find this celebrity mannerisms and the way they dress and all that, watch how it's gonna change. Number four, 
You're going to see 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33. It says, bad company corrupts good morals. You're going to find that for a season after today, they're not going to unite with other people. Oh, you missed what I just said. They're not going to do events with other people. They're going to start focusing on just their ministry because they don't want to be affiliated with that anymore. Why? Because now, after today, we are saying guilt by association. So what they're going to do is they're going to remove the guilt by removing the association. So you're going to see a lot of, well, I was kind of uniting with people, but now I'm just focusing on what's me and my ministry and our church, and I'm just going to focus here. Why? Because now they don't want to have anything to do with someone who's now the hot, the, the, uh, on the target and they're being shot at. It's a farce. So they'll now not say that they're down with someone. They'll just go quiet and they'll go and just focus in-house. Number five is, is they will change their financial revenue. They're going to go back to the Dorian principle. So that way nobody thinks Dorian principle means by freely you've received so freely. Gave. They're going to go from charging and now they're going to start offering things at extremely low or even back to being free because they don't want to be labeled as being money hungry. You're going to see a lot of that. That's going to be a secondary response. It's fake and it's a farce. But this last one, and Mike, I want you to join this one. This one is called the Squid Ink Defense. Like a squid. I'm not talking about the octopus. I'm talking about a squid. A squid is similar, like an octopus, but instead of camouflage, it throws out ink. Now, what, is, mm. what does Squid Ink Defense mean? You're gonna find this after today that these individuals are gonna throw ink on everybody. And they're gonna try to put ink on every other ministry. Talking about, you bunch of hypocrites, you, you do this, you do that, you do this as well. That's what the squid does when it's afraid. It throws out a bunch of ink and then it jets. That's what you're going to see. You're going to see a squid-like ink from these individuals starting to tarnish or pull out stuff to try to tarnish the person that's holding them accountable to throw ink on everyone and say, my brother, you, my sister, you got ink on you just like the rest of us. Mike, you need to jump in this because when I shared this and you saw it, you said that this was one of the most revelatory things that you've heard. Come on in and jump in and close yeah, it. Yeah, come on. Well, well, listen, 1 Kings chapter, 1 Kings chapter 21, verse 8, Jezebel commissions leaders to go on a letter writing campaign mm. against Naboth. So when we talk about the squid releases ink, you will see letter writing campaigns, social media writing campaigns. This is one of the tactics of Jezebel. If For those of you who don't know the story of Jezebel, Jezebel was trying to get her husband Ahab a, a vineyard uh, that was owned by a guy named Naboth. And actually he wanted to turn that vineyard into a vegetable garden, which is a prophetic picture of taking something that God designed as great and make and reduce it down to good mediocrity. But how did Jezebel go about killing Naboth? He, she went on a letter writing campaign, had letters that were written and distributed through leaders that sabotaged and then caused Naboth to be killed, thereby releasing his vineyard, which was his ministry, his platform, which was his destiny, his purpose. So what you will see is that people operate under that Jezebelic infrastructure, that Jezebelic demonic emphasis of a letter rating campaign, just like a squid releases ink, Jezebel releases the the ink of a pen, the ink of Ooh, social media. And so just watch for that. And it's manipulation. Watch this. In the beginning was the word. So Satan is not a creator. He's an emulator. He will also use words. And so you've got to be careful. There's people that, that they think that they're just venting. They think that they're setting the record straight. They think that they're getting out. Listen, make it a prayer instead of a post and you'll get better results. Stop going to the internet like it's your personal diary or your journal. It's time to mature. No, I'm not calling you out. I'm calling you up. It's time to go higher. Some of you uh, are, are cooperating with a, a Jezebelic spirit. You don't even know you're doing it. And so here's the thing. Are you teaching people to become more discerning or are you discerning for them? 
Jesus taught people how to become more discerning. If you are the discernment, then then that you're actually getting into the wrong realm. See, when when the serpent came to, and I feel the anointing all over this, and then we're going to do mass deliverance. But when the serpent showed in the garden, it was, hey, Eve, I figured it out for you. If you're always on the internet figuring it out for your audience, instead of teaching them how to figure it out, you're the problem. You're operating in the same spirit of the serpent. My obligation tonight was teach people how to discern, not to discern for them. I'm a conduit for the wisdom and revelation and truth of God's word. And I'm going to get out of the way and let you make up your mind. That's why we didn't have to name names. That's why we didn't come here to name names. As a matter of fact, I want to say this and then we'll transition. For those of you who have been following this podcast for the last two years straight, we have taken up a burden of saying there's a lot of the, the, the internet is the proverbial wild west. And there is all kinds of stuff. I my my mentors and my apostolic oversight are all in their 60s and 70s with fruit that remains, John chapter 15. And they use a phrase, and here's the phrase: if you throw a rock in a pack of dogs and it hits one of them. <laughs> and so here's the thing: if you felt convicted today, if you thought we were talking about you, then maybe we weren't. First of all, don't be so narcissistic as to think everything's about you. You're not that mm. important. But if if I threw a rock into the audience and, it, and you felt like it hit you, then just use it as an opportunity to repent. Use it as an opportunity to change. You know, something that, um, I, and, and, and I'm preparing your hearts for deliverance right now. When I was in my, my training initially for ministry, every single Wednesday at noon, I would go and I would sit in a council of a round table of men of God of every different race. And there was about half a dozen of us. They were all in their 60s and 70s. And I would get rebuked and re and corrected and experience reproof every week. And you know, I would tell them what I was thinking, what I was doing in ministry. And you know what they would tell me? They'd say, son, here's where you missed it. Here's what the word says about it. And they would rip me apart. And then you know what they would tell me when it was over? Now go ahead and take a cookie. And we would pass a, a bag full of cookies around and we would all get rebuked and eat a cookie because we were trying to rewire our brain to say, you know, getting a rebuke feels like eating a cookie. Mm. And I think when, and, and, and that was how I spent my 20s. I had the collective wisdom of about 150 years of ministry experience ripping me apart, and rebuking me every week. And I, and I grew to love that. And the problem is we got people now today who are not accountable and they're in ministry. They only listen to the things they agree with. They've mm. never been rebuked. They've never received a no from a man of God and said, you know what? If it's a no, it's a no. I'm not going to move forward. And it shows. And so these broadcasts are important, guys. And I know I talk probably more on this broadcast than any other Demon Slayer podcast. But you know what? This is my wheelhouse. I want to, at John chapter 15, I want to remain. I don't want to be a fad. I don't want to be a trend. I want you guys to watch my t beard turn from black to gray right in front of you. I already lost my hair. And I want and I want to go the distance, man. Come you, on. Rebuke me. Correct me. Tell me where I'm wrong. I give these guys the opportunity to speak into my life, and I don't always have to agree. Here's, here's another term for you. What about an experiment with obedience? What about mm. trying it someone else's way? What about trying to have an experiment with submission? And I think this, that there was such a level of humility. I cherish Isaiah Saldivar's rebuke. I cherish, I feel like I'm going to cry right now. I cherish Pagani's correction and rebuke. This is gold coming off their tongue. This is honey to me. When they're speaking the word of God and I get to sit under the, the weight of this kind of teaching, what a, what a privilege. And so I, I just wanted to end with a little bit of humility and help you guys understand the heart behind this. Let's cast some demons out now. Come on. I think it's key what you said. We all need to remain under covering in obedience to God and under men of God. You know, I have multiple men of God I consider spiritual fathers. And I tell all of you guys all the time, if there's anything, I want the conviction. I want the rebuke. I want to change. I want to be humble before God. I don't ever want to be arrogant. I don't want to be exalt myself. I don't care about the likes, the shares. I want to be a son of God. I want to be humble. I want Jesus to show through me. I have zero desire to be known by this or by that. Man, I want to stay teachable and humble and be corrected. And I just put out a video because I misspoke on a video I didn't, that I was ignorant on. Yeah. And I misspoke and said, hey guys, I apologize. I'm sorry. And I, people said, you said sorry like 10 times in one minute. And I'm like, because I am. I don't want to get in a place where I'm above correction. 
I don't want to get in a place where I'm above reproach. I don't want to get in a place where I think I know it all. I want to respond to every altar call. I want to be on my face, on my knees. I want to be a good husband, a good father, stay under my pastor, stay a part of my local church. And guys, if we're honest, a lot of the guys we're talking about tonight, they aren't submitted. They have no spiritual covering. They have no accountability. They're not, they don't love the local church. I'm always leery about people that don't love the local church. And so, man, we got to stay humble. We got to stay obedient to God. Uh, let's pray some mass deliverance. Mike, your camera's out of focus. So that's like telling a friend, hey, you got something on your face. I got to make sure I tell you because you tell me. But let's pray mass it's deliverance. Weird. We're not going to go long, guys, on the renouncing and forgiveness. I just want to attack some of these spirits. I know both of you guys just talk. So if you want, I'll shout out these demons and then you guys can jump in however you feel fit. But I want to go after these demons, these spirits. Do your, many of you in here, you've done your renouncing, you've done your unforgiveness, you've done your repentance. Let's call these demons out. We have networks, deliverance maps, events everywhere. You can go to any of our websites and find deliverance. You can go to our churches, find deliverance, all of that. But I want to just start calling some of these demons out. So we right now, we command every foul spirit yeah. to be bound in Jesus' name. Satan, you have no power. You have no authority. I sever all the ties of witchcraft, of deception, of the new age, of the occult. In Jesus' name, I sever yeah. your ties. Loose these people now. Every mind control spirit, every spirit of witchcraft, every plan of prophetic deception, I bind you now. Every assignment, you are canceled in Jesus' name. Satan, the blood is against you. You have no power. You have no authority. I come against all resentment, spirit of hatred, spirit of violence, unforgiveness, spirit of rebellion, disobedience, anti-submissiveness spirit. I come against you now. Mm. Every spirit of strife, contention, argument, quarreling, fighting spirit, control spirit, possessive spirit. Right now, every spirit of dominance and witchcraft, I bind you, come up and out now in Jesus' name. Every spirit of criticism, accusation, uh, division, I bind you in Jesus' name. Come up and out now. Rejection, fear, insecurity, jealousy, right now. Every spirit of depression and anxiety, we bind you and we call you out now. Every mental illness spirit controlling your mind, plaguing you, the blood is against you. We command every spirit up and out in Jesus' name. Up and out, confusion, this is a big one. Confusion, you must go. You can't stay. These people are not your home. I cast you out now in Jesus' name. Not in my authority. Isaiah has no power, no authority. In Jesus' name, I come against every mind-bending spirit right now. Fear of man, I come against you now. Spiritism, occult spirits, I bind you. In Jesus' name, idolatry, I come against you right now. Lying, deceit, pride, ego, vanity, haughtiness, arrogance, I come against you now in Jesus' name. Every spirit of, of vanity and ego, frustration, infirmity, death, right now. Yeah. Every cursing spirit, spirit of blasphemy, we come against you now in Jesus' name. Every backbiting spirit, every spirit of addiction mm. and compulsion, go in Jesus' name. You have no power. Every sexual demon, lust, spirit of fantasy, masturbation, homosexuality, adultery, fornication, rape, incest. I bind you in Jesus' name. Go in Jesus' name. I command you up and out right now. Right now, every spirit of religion, ritualistic spirit, formalistic spirit, doctrinal obsession, right now, false theology, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, Islam, Catholicism, every spirit that's leading you astray, Every spirit of Jehovah's Witness right now, we bind you in Jesus' name. We command you up and out. We come against you now. You have no power. You have no authority. Satan, get your hands off the people of God right now. Get yes. your hands off of their minds, off of their marriage, off of their children. Some of you better just say right now, Satan, get off my kids. You have no power. You have no authority. I call you out of my kids now in Jesus' name. The blood is against you. Every foul spirit, go now in Jesus' name. The blood is against you. The fire of God is against you. We plead the blood right now. We pray the blood of Jesus, the power of the Holy Spirit, the finger of God that drives yeah. out every impure spirit. Lord, right now I pray by your finger you would send it right now and drive these demons out in Jesus' name. False anointings, false Holy Spirit, kundalini, false prophecy spirits, right now, go all manipulation, get out now. Any spirit 
that came into me from opening myself to false teaching, false prophecies, and new age. Maybe you opened your third eye, close it in Jesus' name. Yes. Close it in Jesus' name. That Hinduism and Buddhism, get out of me. This is not for me. This is not God. This is unscriptural, and I command it, leave me now. And some of you need to just break out in self-deliverance right now. Start calling these. Well, I need a man of God. No, break out in self-deliverance right now. Start calling these things yeah. out of you, rebuking these things now. Disease, sickness, infirmity, right now, all confusion. If you guys want to tag in, I know I covered pretty much everything, but if you want to, anything specific you want to hit, go for it. We come against the demon of extreme honor. Mm. Demon of extreme honor, wrong impartation, demons, mm. sonship, idolatry. Come out of them now in the name of Jesus. Yes. Thus, come out of them now in the name of Jesus. Prophetic abuse spirits, wrong impartation, false covering. Come out of them now in the name of Jesus. Prophetic addiction, deliverance, idolatry. Come out of them now in the name of Jesus. Codependency on spiritual paternity. Extreme idolatry over human leader. Out now. Human idolatry. Out now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Mammon spirit. Out mm. now. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Mike, jump in there now. Whew. I'm feeling this. I, you know, there's somebody that really needs to go deeper renouncing the yep. new age. There's many, many people that have gone into the new age, and right now you need to renounce. As a matter of fact, I need you to destroy any and all objects in your home connected to the new, the new age. You've been convicted the entire time. I need you to destroy those objects right now. In the name of Jesus, we sever every ungodly soul tie. We break the power of that bewitching spirit. We command you to be loose from the influence of every false prophet right now in the name of Jesus. I break the power of obsession. Every obsessing spirit, every spirit of obsession, that bewitching spirit, your power is broken. Loose them now. Go yes. in the name of Jesus right now. There is a clarity that's being released right now. There is a focus that is being released right now. As a matter of fact, there's a spirit. I see a spirit like the little foxes that spoil the vine. Mm. Every little fox, I slay you now in the name of Jesus. Every little fox, I cancel your assignment by the blood of Jesus. There's some of you that your ears, I see in the spirit that you're, you've been giving to your ear to too many people and the confusion is coming by the multiplication of voices and the Lord is asking you right now will you remove voices will you become focused in this next season will you listen to my voice says the Lord will you give ear to me will you hear what I have to say there's many people watching right now I dare you it's time to unsubscribe it's time to block it's time to unfollow it's time to focus there's books there's literature there's propaganda that you need to get rid of right now and you need to focus down because the Lord is calling to a place of focus so i don't know who that was for but i believe that right now you're getting locked into that thank you lord guys what an incredible we have been going about almost three hours we're 10 minutes from three hours we did break 10,000 viewers praise the lord we sat around 9,000 to 10,000 the in, pretty much the entire broadcast i want to also say thank you to jenny weaver and the core group for allowing us to stream on her page i want to thank charisma magazine and charisma news uh, pagani reached out to them and they posted and publicized this all over the place and that's also amazing also i want to make sure that you guys know and shout out to pastor greg Locke and global vision bible church because next month come out in Jesus name will be streaming on all platforms so pastor Greg if you're still on here we want to shout you out and shout out the movie that will be on all platforms on deliverance next month do you guys want to know more about deliverance you can get that there um, I'll stay on after I get them off because it's midnight for them I'll stay on and ask you guys to give and so into their ministries and I want to also challenge you when we do these these are all free content this was a master class tonight we did free again we're not charging for this content but we do want to, you guys to pray about sowing into what God is doing sowing into the ministries and you can sow into any of our ministries we don't care whatever page you give whatever you want it doesn't matter we're not about income we're about outcome or else we wouldn't be doing this for free and so let us know if you guys enjoyed this what how crazy I think this is the fourth time ever in three years we've hit 10,000 um actually the last time we had 10,000 was us three we did 10,000 with us three me and Jenny Weaver hit 10,000 actually me and Jenny Weaver hit 10,000 twice us three hit 10,000 we hit 10,000 tonight and I hit 10,000 one time so what an amazing thing the more people that get 
this message the better we know it'll get hundreds of thousands of views and downloads as the weeks come we had all these technical difficulties the devil is a liar here we are we made it three hours with nothing shutting down there was some tech difficulties but it's all good it's all part of streaming we can't get mad about it um guys we have nothing to gain doing this we have nothing to gain calling things out and but we have to do it. It's not fun to do. It's not fun to call things out, especially when we have friends that are connected with friends and there's it ensues different drama, but we have to do this. We have to stay in line with scripture. And so if you think we have motives doing this, our only motive is to protect the people of God, is to shield the people of God and to stay true to orthodox Christianity and the scriptures. We don't want to get off into new age stuff. We have to blow the trumpet and we can't be hypocrites. If we call out celebrities, we can't be hypocrites and allow this stuff in the church, guys. We can't be posting stuff about secular companies, but afraid to talk about. You guys.